morning, everybody, um, and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, this morning, the the warmest, the hottest day of the year so far. So thank you for sacrificing not uh, being outside and looking at this uh, webinar instead. Um, my name is Edward Hobson. I'm the head of design and innovation at the KTN Knowledge Transfer Network. Um, I'll be chairing the uh, session today. Uh, and I'm joined with a range of colleagues from across KTN and Innovate UK and various experts um, to give you uh, really an opportunity to hear from across various fields uh, and, and disciplines relating to this, uh, this challenge of how do we design more sustainable plastic solutions. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, KTN is the UK's innovation network and we work very closely with Innovate UK. Uh, we, our role principally is to help companies on their innovation journey to find the right connections and to find the right expertise in terms of developing new product services um, and taking those to market. Uh, so why are we here today? Well, the purpose of this particular online event is to inspire and guide companies' interests in using opportunities for how design can address a key environmental and social challenge, which is how to use plastics to use sustainably. Um, the amount of global plastic waste last year was uh, around 275 million tonnes. Um, just to put that into some degree of perspective, that's a, a very crude 35 kilos per person across the whole planet, which clearly is not, uh, not a desirable thing. Um, and as, as individual businesses, as, as, uh, as individuals and as businesses and as organisations and as the, as, the as the country, we need to find uh, more solution, uh, sustainable solutions to this problem, ultimately reducing the amount of, of plastic waste in entering our environment. Uh, in this space, there's been a, a, quite a considerable amount of um, interest, funding, activity, innovation, um, and this uh, online event is really preceding the opening of a competition um, at the start of June, which Innovate UK are launching around designable sustainable plastic solutions. Uh, so with that in mind, what will we hope you uh, will leave today? Um, what can you take away from this particular session? So we hope that you will take away an understanding of how might you uh, tackle your next uh, particular project in terms of developing uh, your business or your particular portfolio and how you might use design, human-centered design in that next stage of your, your company's development. Um, and really also an understanding of with that in mind, whether or not this forthcoming competition is for you, whether it's relevant for you, whether it's appropriate for you, and how you might then uh, go about applying for it. If you've joined us for a KTN um, briefing event before, you'll notice this is a slightly different format. Um, I think the, the availability of doing this online actually allows us a bit more flexibility to do things differently. Um, so we wanted to run this very much as uh, you will get uh, uh, the information on the competition, which is really important, how to apply, eligibility, scope, details, timescales, and so on. But also we wanted to really explore the opportunity space here because I think it's the competition itself is quite broad ranging and we'd want to draw in different perspectives and different people to perhaps make those opportunities more tangible and really understand how we could um, optimize those opportunities for, for the range of businesses who may be interested in this competition. Um, and we'll Proposed to do this this morning by a range of, uh, of conversations, of short structured conversations and interviews with a range of, um, of experts that we have across different fields, be they from um, uh, KTN, be they from Innovate UK, be they from companies who are working in this field, be they from design experts who will be able to help companies along this journey. So very much looking at how we do it in a reasonably informal way. Um, each session will last around 15 minutes of kind of structured conversation between host and guest. Um, and we will invite commentary, questions in the Q&A box, which I'll ask Anita to explain how we run through that in a, in a short while. Just to give you a little um, sight of the agenda, have this part. Uh, you'll be glad that this is essentially an hour from now for the morning session and an hour rejoining it at one o'clock for the afternoon. So giving you a nice break to be able to move away from the computer screen. Um, our sessions this morning, we will first hear from Nick Cliff, um, who is the Deputy Challenge Director for Smart Sustainable Plastic Solutions at Innovate UK, and Sally Beckin, who's the Knowledge Transfer Manager for Polymers at KTM. 
but to really introduce the, the opportunities and the demand uh, for sustainable plastic solutions and, and, and why this activity in this space right now. Um, moving on from there to look at the potential solutions um, from how do you introduce human centered design into this space. So hearing from Clive Grinier, who's head of service design at the Royal College of Arts and Ben Griffin, who's innovation lead for design at Innovate UK. We'll then hear from uh, Greg Lavery from Wright Office in terms of how uh, different approaches and applying um, uh, design into, into business is really bringing perhaps different perspectives and, and uh, really hearing Greg's story from how that, how that business has succeeded in their space. And then wrapping that up with a Q&A, which uh, will proceed our lunch break. After, after our lunch break, uh, actually during lunch, there'll be an opportunity for um, seeing a couple of um, case study videos that we already have in terms of demonstrating the application of design into business. Um, and also, uh, Anita will just run through the uh, meeting mojo sessions in terms of being able to do a little bit of online virtual networking in that time, if you wish to do that. We'll convene again about one o'clock and again, hear from uh, businesses who are actually implementing um, this, these approaches and this thinking. So from Ryan of Pity Clee, uh, one o'clock uh, and conversation with Sally. And at quarter past one, um, so the last session before we look at the competition itself, we'll hear from Emma Burlow and, and in conversation with Ben Peace, who's head of manufacturing at KTN, in terms of looking at the development and application of new business models in this space and very much drawing sort of circular economy principles. That's a very sort of quick um, run through the order of the day. Um, Anita, can you just give us a quick clarification of how um, our participant would um, questions and and avail themselves of the q a will do thanks very much ed um so just some housekeeping at the bottom of your screen um most of you will have already found the chat box as you're um introducing yourselves at the moment you can use that box for general comments um introducing yourselves and networking uh, if you're looking for anyone in particular you might want to um, put your name um, and details in those in that box so that everybody who is logged into the webinar can see that and connect with you uh, offline the chat box is also used for if you have any technical um, issues you can't hear your sound or you can't see the screen um, i will be managing that in the back end and i'll be able to sort of private message you to um, help you out with certain things so do um, look out for messages on there also, we at the bottom of the screen, you will also find a box called Q&A. This particular box is used for questions that you want to pose to any of our speakers and presenters and panelists um, about the actual subject area and um, the topic, any um, information that you've seen um, which has been presented today. That could be um, about the topics that the speakers are talking about. Um, it could also be about the competition scope, backgrounds, application process all of that information if you type in those questions into the Q&A box not the chat box but that way we can have all of those questions in one place and um, they can then be answered that would be great um Ed without further ado I'll pass it back to you oh and also just remembered as well um you will have also seen information about our, our online one-to-one -one networking system meeting mojo so you've all received instructions on how to set a profile up. This system is um, available for you to use to book meetings during the lunch hour, which will be from around 12.25 to about sort of 12.55 and um, just after the event as well. It'll also be available at the same times tomorrow and Friday. So don't worry if you don't have the time to set your profile up today um, live, you will have chance to um, set it up after the event. And um, it's a really great tool if you're looking for partners to connect with um, any collaborations. Um, you might want to perhaps have a chat with people that you have heard speak who are on the actual system as well. So do please set up your profiles and um, get networking. I will actually post the instructions in the chat box again if anybody wants to um, log in. They can do that live. I'm, I'm approving the setups in the back end. So please do. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Anita. Um, so I'm going to just 
stop sharing my screen in relation to the um, agenda and invite um, Sally and Nick um, to, to, to sort of kick off um, the discussion really. So we're, we're looking at how do you design more sustainable uh, or the use of sus uh, plastics more sustainably. So um, as a very opener, what, for you both, what are the un unresolved problems um, in this space that exist at the moment? Nick, do you want to... Okay, and the, the two is going to go first. It's me. Uh, well, uh, thanks, Ed. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, gosh, where to begin? So, uh, I'll start by, by saying, I don't, you know, for me, plastics as a category of materials are not themselves intrinsically a problem. You know, a lot of, I think a lot of people would, uh, or at least I would hope a lot of people would agree that there are very few intrinsically problematic materials. It's in the application, our use of them, and our relationship with them that has led us to the kinds of images we see, uh, even still in the midst of, uh, uh, of, of the current global situation, uh, you know, you still get news about levels of plastic pollution. Um, plastics themselves are, are amazing materials. They're incredibly strong, uh, they're incredibly durable. Um, you know, the clue is in the name. You can form them into almost any shape. Um, and they underpin almost all sort of supply chains, product categories. You have to look very hard in this world at the moment to find something that plastic isn't, that there isn't plastic in there somewhere. Uh, and they do the job well and um, they unlock all sorts of things, personal electronics, food distribution, food supply, medicines, construction, transport. Um, but, and sadly there's always a but, the challenge comes when we're finished with that thing. Um, and uh, you know, that's where we start to branch out into a whole range of challenges. But I'll, I'll pick two. Uh, uh, on the on the basis that I, I don't want to preempt everything Sally was going to say, but um, you know, one of the areas I think that, that that that's increasingly problematic is you know plastics are so cheap that yeah. they have contributed to a culture of disposability. This concept that you can have a thing that does a thing, but when it's done its thing, I'm not worried about it anymore. Uh, I've never managed to find out exactly when the first disposable product was created. Um, you know, you start looking into these sorts of things, people will talk about the fact that I think a paper plate was invented in the late 1800s. Um, I mean, these are mass produced disposable things. Around about the same time, you had uh, paper collars and, and cuffs for shirts. Um, this, this notion that you can make something and then when I'm finished with it, even though it might still be fine, I'm just, just going to get rid of it. I find it fascinating that around about the same time, was when we were first inventing and mass, or looking at mass production using polymers, synthetic polymers. And of course, the very first products that were made from polymers were designed to be durable goods. Things like um, pieces of jewellery, um, fishing reels I've seen at the V&A, uh, uh, combs, combs. And I'm, look, look, Sally, I'm probably pinching yeah, all of that. I'm right? just thinking, you're, you're, you're saying almost exactly what I'd say, in that, you know, they, yeah. they are functional, um, and the material choice, you know, actually, arguably, plastics are already sustainable. We use them because they're cheap, and cheap actually means that you haven't put much energy effectively into the, the processing of them, and therefore the life cycle analysis would give you a, a, a low impact in terms against other materials, generally speaking. But what's happened is that they become ubiquitous. I mean, I've got an example here of just something that you've completely and utterly you know talking about something that's mass produced in the millions per annum uh yeah obviously you're not using this anymore Nick. um uh and actually this one's really complicated it's got this is a soft grip uh it's probably a tpe it's probably probably pro polypropylene the the sheath on here is probably polystyrene so you know it, we've we've made it because the material's got the properties that we want and require from it but in terms of end of life it's a really difficult to deal with and b no one really cares about it they just throw it away and use another one um so, so, so you've mentioned a couple of things that uh, are similar here about disposal and the end of life 
um, and they're good for certain uses, but then abused at the end of the life. Um, so, um, how how do we how do we shape solutions at that part of the of the process? I'm oh. Oh, oh, well, this is a bit difficult. Sorry. After you, after you yeah. this time, Sally. I, my experience in, in mass producing widgets is, and I, the company I work for will probably shoot me for calling them a widget, but medical device devices are made in the hundreds of millions per annum. Um, and we need them to keep ourselves he healthy. Uh, but normally, and certainly when I was working there 20 years ago, there was no, no consideration at the design stage for what would happen at the end of life some considerations around some of the material choices and, and you know for example i actually have a patent which is connecting the cap of a medical device to the the, the housing so that the parts don't fall apart that was for a hygiene issue but actually it could be a sustainability issue but making manufacturers think about what's going to happen to their product at the end of life is probably the really difficult thing um, it's not happening across all sectors, it's happening in some, and it's happening in the ones where uh, consumers are making a fuss, and in a good way. And so to come in, you know, how, how do we achieve better outcomes at the end of life? Um, one, way, one way to approach this in the first instance is actually to, I suppose, postpone that end of life. So how do we help create products that are not just more durable physically, many plastic products are very physically durable. Take a typical, um, I don't, are we, I'm not sure we're allowed to mention brand. If I, you know, if I said Biro, that's a brand, but you know, classic bit crystal Biro. Um, if you uh, get to the end of the life of that bit Biro, for the most part, it's still a perfectly durable product. Um, there's still absolutely, there's no, there's no, there's no real degradation to speak of, 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 of the product itself, but it, it, it's got that finite lifespan. So there are ways around it. You know, you, you can, you can make pens refillable, but then you're adding layers of inconvenience to the product. And I think that's one of the, one of the big challenges the, what, what the cheapness and ubiquity of plastic have, have given us is it's helped move us towards a culture where convenience is prized very highly. And unless you carefully think through how you make something inconvenient in one way, hopefully replacing that with making it convenient in other ways, um, you're really going to struggle to change the outcome for these products at the end of their life. Um, you know, I, I'm, always, I'm always minded of, um, and, and I use the photo a lot. I'm sure many people on the, on the Zoom have seen it. There's a very famous picture from a, a 1950s edition of Life magazine celebrating the throwaway society where the article itself is, is heralding the ons, ons, on, I was going to use the word onslaught, this huge explosion in disposable products. And, and they got everything there from disposable plates to disposable saucepans. Why are they convenient? Because you don't have to wash them up. Uh, I think at one point in the article, it even talks about disposable duck hunting decoys. So with plastic, you can make a, I have to imagine, a fake duck to lure other ducks to their doom so cheaply that after you've thrown them out into the pond, you don't have to worry about going and getting them. Uh, and that's where I think, and, and that sort of leads us really to some of the, 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 the the principles behind what we're trying to do with the competition and, and trying to support the kinds of work that we're going to hear about in the other sessions is how do you design ways to, to roll back and replace the types of convenience that, how do you move from a disposable product to one that kind of you've built into it a decent outcome at the end of its life? having already hopefully explored extending its life as long as you can. Yeah, and I'll just sort of add to that. I mean, I think the reason a lot of things are thrown away is because we're lazy, which is essentially what you've just said. And if we can make things better by design so that, so that we don't know we're doing the right thing, we shouldn't really have to think about it because in that way, if we can design things we don't have to think about doing the right thing for, then the behavior essentially will, will be different. So, so you've mentioned some interesting things there about 
Um, you've talked conceptually about disposal, but people dispose of stuff um, and people behave in particular ways or incentivized to be to do certain things. Um, so um, it, have in your experience, man, people who, you know, manufacturers and companies who are in the space of creating things made of plastics, um, what, is, what has been their engagement in trying to understand that, uh, that the stage where disposal is likely or, or people are making decisions about what to choose, what to dispose of, uh, what to disregard? I mean, have, have manufacturers really um, embraced the ways of trying to understand that? your perspectives i can pick up an example in i was on a uh, a conference last night with with america and, and one of the speakers was from dell and dell computers are easy to disassemble so that you can pick out the component parts either to a recycle or b repair uh, and i thought that was a fantastic ethos they compared it with a, a another company's product which scored very very badly uh in terms of being able to yeah, extend the life. And, and actually, the, the, the speaker, unfortunately, I didn't catch his name or don't remember his name. He actually said that they want to make products that improve with age. So they don't get worse with age, you know, worn and torn. They want some, some inherent, you know, part of that product to, to be better as you keep hold of it. Now, whether that's because you're attached to it in some way, uh, psychologically, I mean, I have this very old, 30 years old Tupperware container, which was my mum's and I'm attached to it. So for me, I have a connection with that that makes me use it for a long period of time. And if you could encapsulate that in, in other products that are quite complex, that would be a really interesting thing to happen. You know, hold on to your asthma inhaler because I don't know, it's pretty, it's colored there's a connection to you it's got your name stuck on the side i don't know that connection and making it desirable to someone i think would be really important to to put into des plastic design products that, that concept of emotional durability as well as, as mm -hmm. sort of physical durability um but yeah i think that a lot of manufacturers a lot of product designers are starting to to think and do in this space um i've seen lots of ideas clever ideas to make a product more long lasting. Uh, we see lots of clever ideas around, um, uh, particularly, for example, in the space of plastic packaging at the moment, trying to encourage people to switch from disposable packaging to reusable packaging. Uh, or, and that's not just the product itself, it's the entirety of the service. Um, although, of course, one of the, one of the challenges is that it, it's, and again, with, with, you know, it, I, I've seen some remarkable work designing better products. Um, uh, one of the challenges, of course, is it's, it's much more difficult to design better consumers. Um, I'm sure many of us would, uh, would like to have a go if we could. But uh, uh, so what you have to think about particularly is, is really understand how people will interact with a product. I've seen concept designs, product designs, I've seen them being tested of uh, 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 products that are, have, have, have been sort of thought out really carefully to try to encourage consumers to quote unquote, do the right thing, only to see them fail spectacularly. What is it they say? Um, there's, the, there's, always a, there's always a bigger idiot out there. Uh, you can't make things idiot proof because we're, we're better at innovating idiots not. But uh, you know, it, there are there are ways that there are means that can be done and sometimes they're remarkably subtle um how do you you know cause people to sort of change behavior um there's carrot approaches um i get um a quite a surprisingly or at least i did when i was out buying coffee um i haven't i'd have to sort of have my own reward card at home at the moment but um you know when i was out before <laughs> in old time as we like to call it now uh, if I took a reusable coffee cup, which was an inconvenience, I had to carry it, I had to rinse it out, um, I would get 25, 50p uh, off the price of my coffee, which is 10 times, 20 times what the paper cup that the company is actually saving is worth. Um, for plastic bags, um, you know, they went with a stick approach. 
Um, if I fail to take my reusable bags to a shop, I would get, I have to pay 5p, 10p for reusable bags that um, I would still have to deal with, you know, how many people now have a huge room full of dis disposable bags. But there's all sorts of clever, subtle ways that we can influence people to change their behavior. Um, I, and we were talking before, before the event about sort of uh, weird examples. And uh, I, I didn't know if I was going to say this, but, you know, the, that people have seen uh, uh, ways to encourage gentlemen to be a little bit more careful, perhaps when they're visiting public conveniences, by putting little plastic flies into urinals um, because it helps uh, focus the aim, shall we say. So all sorts of subtle ways that if we, if we put the, the person, the consumer uh, at the heart of the process and think, how do I change their behavior to get a better outcome and uh, possibly a drier floor? <laughs> how can I follow that? How can I follow that? Um, I used to use a ping pong ball for my son when I was training him, but there you go. Same thing. Um, I think patented that, Sally. Also, there's, a, there's a, a subtlety between products or services that are desirable and, we, and, and those that are necessary. And I wonder whether there's a different approach required or needed. Um, obviously, you know, coming from the medical device industry, they're necessary devices. Uh, but a lot of stuff that we buy and, and we turn over and companies make profit from are things that we don't actually need. And that desirability in design, how do we keep desirability and, and also have sustainability at the same time? Um, conversation with someone said, you know, um, ha just because it's, uh, you know, sustainable doesn't mean it isn't beautiful. Um, weren't my words, a conversation with someone I had a, a couple of years ago. I think it's really interesting making it desirable, but without uh, compromising on sustainability is, it would be a really great thing to have to pick out and tie to human behavior, which is probably, part of this project that the you know, challenge is about. That's, that's probably a great uh, note to, to kind of wrap up on. Um, how do we use design to make, to, to embed desirability without compromising, but or perhaps potentially yet with, with enhancing um, the environmental performance of that thing? Um, so we've touched on a number of uh, big areas around how do we influence behavior of certainly of consumers, um, perhaps of other people within the supply chain. Um, consumers are not the only uh, stakeholder. Um, we've looked at, well, we've talked about the design of particular products. We've talked, we've touched on the design of services um, and also how this might affect the design of businesses. Um, that almost uh, is a perfect segue into inviting Ben and Clive um, to almost respond to some of the challenges there um, because this is around how do we help businesses to realize this. Sally has um, drawn on experiences of um, some frustrations with, with design only being seen as a engineering discipline or a sort of it only goes so far and, and doesn't necessarily reach into the um, realm of how do we understand how you know, in here what what is going on in, in people's heads <clears throat> and how that influences their behavior so i'd invite uh, ben as innovate uk lead on design and clive as head of design from uh, the royal college of arts hello to you both thank you for hello. joining us this morning um you've been listening to the conversation so far um and i'm going to ask sally to kind of i'm going to pass literally pass the mic over um, to Sally to perhaps put some of those questions uh, to you on, on, on really these are the challenges that we've heard for various uh, sectors and, and how can design from a, perhaps a product and a service perspective um, bring some solutions around understanding human behavior uh, and, and really acting in this space to, to help businesses be more sustainable with their use of design and plastics. So, um, Ben, would you, do you want to kick us off? Sure, yeah. Um, I think what we've heard this morning is um, lots of mention of, of human behaviour and a need to understand not only the technical issues around uh, design of, of products and solutions, but also um, making sure that they, they're founded on a, a really rich understanding and nuanced understanding of um, of the needs and, and behaviours and motivations of people. 
Um, and I certainly think that design is something that, that, that can contribute in that sense. Um, we will talk a little bit, I think, about the different design disciplines and traditionally those have perhaps been based on the type of output being created. So a product designer might be concerned with 3D form and, and manufacturing and materials. A, a, a UX or interface designer more interested in uh, on-screen digital interfaces, graphic designers working in, in two dimensions and so on. But I think increasingly we're moving into a space where those boundaries are beginning to blur. We're, we're all now familiar with accessing complex digital services via an on-screen interface on a physical product. And the role of the designer often is in trying to make that, that entire experience as seamless and as frustration-free as possible. So there's a blurring of the boundaries there in terms of the, the um, design disciplines, if you like. And I think what becomes more important is actually the approach or methodology that you're taking to the design. So it's less about I'm a product designer and it's more about I'm approaching the design problem from a human centered perspective versus perhaps being focused on the technical aspects, design for manufacture and so on. Shall I jump in? <laughs> or do you have a question? <laughs> Sorry, I, I had my husband walk past. It's just <laughs> working at home. He threw me and the call was for me. And I was sort of thinking, don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, more information than required. Um, thanks, Len. Um, I mean, just coming from where I used to sit, which was mass producing widget, widgets um, for necessary items. Are there any sort of examples or um, tools or, you know, methodology you should use? Um, or could use to make something that's necessary more sustainable. I don't know if I'm quite dragging out that the difference there, but it's always been, is it functional? Does it perform? It's about the, for a medical device, for example, the delivery of the right amount of drug to the patient. Where in that design loop is the connection to behavior and or material use for sustainability do you see? Do you want to pick that up, Clive, or I, I could have a go. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was going to come back to your uh, concept of a design as, as a whole, but I think interestingly, one of the areas that that we have been doing in service design, which ten second explanation is the application of all the same methodologies we use when we're designing a product or a user interface, but looking at a much broader systemic view and very, very human centered. We've done a lot of work at the Royal College of Art about helping businesses help other businesses be more sustainable, for example. And, and even in a medical widget, um, there are end consumers. You know, my son's a diabetic. He can't stand the amount of waste in that process that allows him to survive. He's very grateful for it. <laughs> but he is a consumer as well. The problem in, in widget space is that the drive of the consumer is, is much lower in the view. If we look at packaging in supermarkets, for example, I've got a crazy friend who will actively unpack all his fruit and veg in front of the cashier to make the bloody point. <laughs> so there's a real consumer drive that we're very aware of now. And I remember being at the Design Council 15 years ago and manufacturers in Britain in the supply chain, global supply chain, not caring at all about sustainability of plastics or anything because they felt they didn't have to. But that's why they lost a lot of jobs when people in Japan or Korea or other parts of the world said, no, we're going to abide by a new bunch of sustainability rules now. So there's, that's the kind of stick where the world comes up with legislation and you have to work within that framework and you need to be creative how you do that. So I'm a big believer that even down to invisible widgets, there kind of is a consumer there, but there's also a benefit to the business you're selling to and the rules that they are now having to play at. So, um, I, you know, and, and it's incredibly impressive that KTN and Innovate have really taken on design because it has always been the massive missing link in British industry, frankly. Um, and what we do at our college uh, is take that view, um, that four part process really of saying, discover what on earth you can do, what on earth you need to do, discover what the human is really doing and let's face it, in areas like packaging, the humanity of packaging has never been there. 
<laughs> you know, if you're an old person trying to get into a jam jar, it's not a very good experience. <laughs> but people don't think about the human. They just think about the problem of keeping something fresh or yeah. whatever it might be. Yeah. You've got to think of the reframe the problem. And that's the second part. We discover, we define, we reframe the problem. And then we know the problem we're trying to solve. And that's when we get creative. And our uh, ethos and agenda is don't just have one idea, have lots. And the final part of the design process, it's so simple, is to test it first. You know, test it at a very early stage. Make a mock-up, make a prototype. Does it work? How you think? Does, is your system able to deliver it? Does it provide the benefits? And where there is a consumer, even if it's just another business, do they get it? Do they see the benefit? Does it hit their mark? So many businesses have one idea, spend a lot of money, it doesn't work and it wasn't even the right problem. And it happens all the time. And people say to me, Clive, what you say is just common sense, to which I say, yes, so why don't you do it? <laughs> <laughs> what anyway, I'm rant hearing, over. <laughs> what I'm hearing is that design of a product and design of a service is intermingled. They, you know, they can't stand alone. They can't be done in isolation. Uh, and they can't be done without the humans as well. So are there any lessons from other sectors or injuries or other materials that would apply to plastics that you've come across that might be you know we could use at scale for example for either of you um well i mean i'll just quickly jump in i think that i used to be a product designer i was so disgusted with the material wastage that i became a service designer <laughs> you know i used to design fax machines we got rid of those through networks and telecommunications so there's a systemic view to do you even need the thing in the first place but of course sometimes you do of course sometimes you do and the other aspect from my point of view about the changes you have to make the examples are that there are some brilliant ideas around let's say recycling or reuse of materials but you need the system to be as good as the product and idea. We recently gave a design prize to a toothbrush that was developed for the Indian market. And we were very unhappy. Uh, this is another organization I was chairing. We we're actually very unhappy about giving that award because the product itself was brilliantly designed for recycling and removal of material. But in India, there is not the associated system yeah. Yeah. to recycle. So we would end up on a beach just like all the other 20, empty billion toothbrushes that end up on Indian beaches. So you, even if you have a brilliant engineering idea, it always needs to live within the bigger system. And I think that's the lesson here. So you have to think about that um, as well as the human impact. So sorry, Ben, if you had any no, thoughts. No, that's, that's quite right. I, I would emphasize all those points. I think coming back to the, the point about um, necessary goods, there is always a human in the loop even if it's B2B, we do tend to fall into this trap of thinking that design is something for high street consumers. And I'm always, I always try and be really careful and talk about human centered design as opposed to user centered or customer centered, because in some cases the human is a, a buyer within a supply chain, or in fact, for a lot of Innovate UK's customers, uh, it might be an investor. You might be developing an early stage technology that could have quite, um, dramatic disruptive uh, impact um, but the end of the, the eventual uh, commercial solution is some way down the line that doesn't necessarily mean you don't need to be thinking about uh, the, the human-centered design it's just that actually your initial priority might be how am I best going to communicate the value of this proposition to an investor or to a potential partner to get them excited about it. Numbers on a spreadsheet will go so far, but actually if you can present a compelling vision of a better future enabled by your innovation, that's gonna get you so much further. Um, so even within in business to business supply chains and so on, we still need to be thinking about the people. Um, and taking that broader view of, as you say, the service to which the, the product um, relates can be very useful even if you are focused you know it's, it's worth just spending a bit of time at the early stage of a project thinking about that reframing the problem as Clive says and abstracting it if you like so a, re, a, a disposable coffee cup only exists because it's an inherent part of a particular service model um, and as you say Sally sometimes it's unavoidable we do need particular products but it's always worth I think um, thinking about you know are you actually solving the right uh, problem or should we be asking a different type of question?
Uh, that's really interesting. That that's brought me along to a a, a, a question that we, you know, if I wanted to design an, uh, a new product or service and influence people's choices, would I need a designer, a marketing guru, or a psychologist? <laughs> yeah, uh, do you know? I think um, again, I think it's not a, a hard line. Now, designers are trained in this. And I think one of the great things that a designer can bring to the process is that is the continuity through from gaining that human insight, using that as a source of inspiration, and then through the testing processes that and, and ideation processes that Clive's mentioned, mm -hmm. taking that through all the way to uh, to delivery and going back to that initial understanding of a product designer being someone who understands manufacturing and materials, an interaction designer being someone who understands how to realize an idea through coding. If you've got that, that spread and, and balance of understanding from the start to the finish of the project, it can, uh, you know, there's a really, it's useful to have that link. But I do think that behavioral psychologists, for example, uh, and marketing also have a role to play. Right. Yeah, I'm just wondering, Clive, if you, yeah. I'm thinking, you know, if you're mass producing widgets, um, as a company, how would you approach that? You know, how would you find a psychologist? Where would you go to? And, you know, how many consumers do you need to involve to get a really good picture of human behavior? Because we're all different. Um, well, obviously, I'd say a service designer, but there aren't that many of them. I'm trying to create as many as I can. Um, but there are, there are a whole bunch of people. And this is more about taking a different approach and asking the right questions. I think as, as was said earlier on, um, I'm, I'm very, in answering this, I'm going to try and answer Barry Thompson's question, if that's okay, who's put in, does the responsibility pass solely to the manufacturers? Um, and, and the answer to that is, um, you could call it responsibility, but I think I might say opportunity, but it's very important to realize that design is not an option. It's not a luxury that we're plastering on. It's actually something you are doing every day when you make a decision and you, you balance your financial with your marketing and sales opportunity. You are actually making design decisions about what you make and how relevant it is to the person you pass it on to. So do you want to call that responsibility? Maybe. Um, the, the sustainable agenda is now a responsibility of all of us, including your customer. <laughs> Um, and so what we're looking for are people that can turn your thinking around, turn the telescope around, understand the context of your product, understand the value of it to others with an agenda of sustainability. And I think really the point is that there's a massive risk if you don't. You know, this is an industry, plastics industry is under huge threat right now. So we need people who might be called service designers, who might be called especially product designers, um, a lot of service designers come from product design because when you design a product, you have to make a, you are victim if you like, and you have to be part of a huge amount of choices of investment in material. What process are you going to use? Are you selling it to one person or a hundred million? All these things have a huge impact on how you design anything. Um, uh, and, and therefore those people are actually very good at helping you make those decisions. So it's a kind of facilitation process to say, what have we got? What could we have? What value could we get out of this? Do we just keep making the same thing and hope nobody notices that we're not very sustainable? Because they will notice. <laughs> they will come and get you and you'll be out of business. <laughs> so do you want to call that responsibility? I think it's an opportunity to rethink what you do and get more value out of it. I honestly think the great thing about the sustainability agenda at the moment is it's been driven by capitalism. <laughs> it's been driven by consumer demand. It's been driven by a lot of people saying, actually, we want to do better. Now use your creativity to be better and definitely use designers because that's what they're trained in doing. They're no longer wizards who just say, do it like this. They're people who facilitate, collaborate, listen, help you get to a better place by going through a design process. That's, Thanks, Clive. That's Thanks, fantastic. Ben. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Clive. Thanks, Sai. Thanks, Ben. Um, that was a, a kind of a tour de force through uh, opportunities and, and really adding some value into that process from a design perspective. Um, one thing that cropped up time and time again was were markets and value. Um, and so perhaps I'd invite um, our other Ben, Ben Peace, who's head of manufacturing at KTN, and, um, and Greg Lavery, who's managing director of RIPE, to, to look at it from a particular company's perspective. Um, and we've talked sort of in, in, in broad terms around the opportunity um, for, for design. We've 
also talked in broad terms around how design can actually add value into this process. So perhaps unpacking a, a real example within a real company and understanding um, Greg's perspectives on this uh, would be would be really useful. So Ben and Greg. Yeah, thank, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, what a what a great discussion it's been. Um, yeah, we've covered uh, notions of beauty, design, big system thinking. Um, so yeah, let, let's let's now, as Ed says, drill into a specific uh, example and hear the story of Ripe Office. Um, so yeah, great to have uh, Greg with us. Um, Greg, can you tell us a bit about your background and the story of how Ripe came came to be? Yeah, I, I'm a structural engineer by training with a bit of a little bit of architecture in there around green buildings. And um, in about 2014, we realised that there were some ridiculous things happening in the um, in the lack of circular economy for furniture in the office furniture game. So, for instance, the statistics that captured our attention were that was that if you think about the embodied greenhouse gas emissions in a commercial building over its entire 40 to 60 year life, 30 percent of that is furniture. And that's because the furniture is thrown away every time the office gets moved, right? Or, or a new tenant comes in. Um, and that's ridiculous. So there's no circularity. The other statistic that shocked me was that 300 tonnes of office furniture is going to landfill every single day. And then there's another 200 tonnes going to recycling. And if you put those numbers together, that's just a huge amount that's going to complete waste when, when you think about the enormous embodied energy that's gone to, to make that furniture up. So we said there's got to be a better way. Um, and then um, actually our history um, uh, interlocked um, very early with uh, KTN. I, I, I recall Ben, I gave you a call and said, look, we've got this idea. What do you reckon? And he said, and Ben said, well, look, I reckon you should get a KTN um, grant for 5K. I think it was some sort of innovation grant to help you do it, which, which brings me back to so Sally's really good point is that uh, this is a, this is a design problem. So the first um, use of that funds, um, we used all of that money to employ a designer, uh, a guy called Mark Shaler, who's a, w a wonderful storyteller and a great designer, to come in to think about that whole proposition, how you design it, how you put a customer friendly face on essentially used furniture and reframe that question. And then obviously we put a ton of engineering into that, which obviously our engineers looked after. Um, and now some six years on, we've done 170 projects. We work for clients um, ranging from uh, big banks like RBS through to large property companies like British Land through to property services companies like JLL and a whole bunch of charities and green organisations and a whole bunch of not very charitable and not very green organisations who frankly are attracted by the price. So our, our proposition is really straightforward. How would you like the same furniture in the same condition um, as new? And we don't like the word new. We use from Virgin Resources. Um, ours is remanufactured with an 80% smaller footprint uh, a price less than half price um, and we create local jobs um, especially for the long-term unemployed with disabled so that's the sort of the ripe office history story sorry it took so long to tell that's that's incredible so you you just to sort of reiterate really and echo some of the discussion earlier with with with, with clive and and uh, ben and so on so you you've you've really drilled into the problem you've understood you know you've conceived the whole business based on a, a, a really solid understanding of the problem. You've asked the right questions, you've, you've prototyped and, and yeah, you're, you're seeing the, the benefits. You're, you're, you're indeed taking that user-led perspective, looking at you know, the, 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 um, the nature of the staff uh, that, that you're selecting and, and the benefits to them of the jobs you're creating. Uh, yeah, this is big. Well, right, and, and, and storytelling is a big part of it as well. That, that sort of marketing edge that Sally talked about. So we talk about instead of new versus used furniture. Now, new is a very value laden term. So we don't use new, we use from Virgin Resources. So we say, how would you like a desk from, from Virgin Resources or one that was in the James Bond movie Spectre? I mean, that, that's a completely reframed uh, it, it question, really. And that starts to shift consumers, as you say, starts to shift the end market in terms of how they consider the linear ver world versus the circular world. OK, so, um, Greg, in, in, in the current, you know, somewhat unprecedented uh, circumstances, um, yeah, how, how are you responding to the virus? You know, there's presumably been some impact of the lockdown on your market. Uh, what, what do you see as 
as the opportunities for the future? How are you dealing with? Yeah, I, 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 I mean, COVID is uh, most of our um, clients are putting one way systems in the office and we're doing our best to talk them out of acrylic screens that will frankly be in landfill in about six months, right? Or 12 months, whatever that looks like. So coming up with smarter solutions about that longer term um, we've, and, and to, to Clive's question of, of, of or, or very good point about reframing the problem. What we realized pretty early on is that there's three horizons um, using McKinsey term, but basically three generations of remanufactured product. Um, and this is where plastic becomes particularly important in the third one, and I'll get to that in a minute. So generation one is you take the top, let's say 10 to 20% of items that are coming back, let's let's call them cores to use the remanufactured term, 10% 10, 10 of items that are being thrown out, you then do a, a, a spit and polish. I mean, obviously it's a bit more engineering like that than, than with uh, quality checking, resurfacing and create as good as new. But the, the point was those items were good quality in the first place. They're ergonomic, well-built, et cetera, et cetera. But that's probably only 10 to 20% uh, of the market. And, and there's a lot of people sort of doing secondhand stuff, um, but not very good quality um, work, but nevertheless to good quality furniture. The second generation in the circular economy for furniture that we see is starting to upcycle that under the top 20% of furniture. So how do you take a product that was okay and make it even better so it's, it's marketable back on the market um, at a good price point? And the third generation where plastics is particularly of interest to us is both generation one and generation two are really dealing with the waste problem and not the inputs. So generation three for us is actually tackling that waste problem and saying, why are we making furniture out of substances that are ridiculous in the first place? Um, and this is this is Clive's reframing the problem. So, for instance, metal mine face chipboard is a personal hate of ours because you take a forest, you you crunch it down into tiny tiny fragments, you put a glue into it um, that bonds it all together, and then you put a plastic surface either side. It's not able to be recycled because if you recycle it, you get dust, and there's no market for dust. Um, so actually, it goes straight to landfill once it gets a scratch on it. So forest desk landfill um, within about five years. A ridiculous process. Um, imagine if you could, instead of using a forest, use post-consumer waste plastic. And that's exactly what we're looking at right now, um, which is how do, you, how do you replace all the MFC um, tops that you've got in an office and meeting rooms and all those sorts of places with beautifully designed plastic. And what we find is really interesting is that this is entirely a design question. Because if you think about what's happened in the plastic world, um, the first and most difficult thing is to convince people not to throw something into the landfill, but to put it into a recycling bin. And that's been happening um, to the extent that's roughly, what, 50% or something, I think, recycled. Terrible, but it's a good start. The next difficult thing is to convince the waste companies to do the separation properly, right? That's been done. The third most difficult thing is then convince those same waste companies to invest hundreds of millions in a proper separation plant so you can get good quality recycler to do something with. And then all you've got really in terms of that circular process, this tiny gap of turning that really good quality recycler into a product that people want to buy. And that's entirely a design problem, which is why, I mean, frankly, we're very interested in this call because we see exactly what KTN's doing with this call is, is recognizing that gap and then I, I suppose exciting interest and stimulating interest and funding interest in coming up with solutions that takes that waste product um, into, into a product that's going to be out there. And, and for us, generation three furniture, let's say a plastic top on a desk should last a hundred years, right? And it's, it's thermoplastic, which means you reheat it, re-squish it or, or, or weld into it. You can um, replace some um, scratches with new material. Um, it's actually a much, much better product than the metal mine face chipboard that it's um, replacing. So for us, that's where plastic becomes really exciting with a whole new way of thinking about it. And wouldn't you rather have in your meeting room a, a table instead of a made out of a very expensive um, sin single use product, have something made of pl recycled plastic that is a talking point that gets you in a, a values based discussion uh, with your visitors and, and, uh, and clients. And that's what what exactly we're seeing in the market right now. Fantastic. <clears throat> so yeah, Greg, you, you've you've um, got a profound understanding of, of how uh, how industry works um, through through ripe office and and past lives. Indeed, um, what advice would you give to um, to manufacturers that are looking to to reduce plastic waste to make their products more sustainable? 
Yeah, really good problem. Uh, really good question. I, I think there's two aspects to that, um, and and I've spoken about both both of them already because they're so important to our history. Um, one is collaboration. Um, you don't have to do all the work of sifting the plastic. And and when we started, we were we actually had a fifth recycling bin where we collected all of our recycled plastic milk bottles and then took them downstairs, put them in a gr in a grinder and ground them all up. You don't have to do that because that's being done by the industry. So reaching out to uh, large scale waste companies who have hundred million dollar plants um, that are sitting there churning out beautiful quality, um, high quality and, and color separated uh, recycling. That's really handy. So actually, um, that sort of collaboration with them to bring in their products in, in a, in a ready-made form that you can then do something with. So that's number one. You don't have to do everything in the value chain yourself. The, and the second one is the importance of design. Um, and that's what we spent our first uh, KTN, in fact, first ever income, which was our KTN grant, thank you very much, Ben, um, was on a designer and design remains really, really important. So we have a marketing guy who's designing our marketing. Uh, we have a full-time product designer now uh, and we still work with all sorts of designers around sort of how you get your, your messages right, how you get your organic and your, and your SEO sorted out, all that sort of stuff. Design is such a big part of changing a waste product and changing customers perceptions so that you've got a product that is valuable ideally at a price point um, higher than um, the alternative because let's face it we have an experience curve to get down um, in replacing some some of existing products like melamine face chipboard that means that recycled plastic is a bit more expensive right now so if someone's prepared to pay a premium and you'll only get that through good design um, that's where we need to be right now. Hopefully in 10 years time or even five years time, um, recycled plastic logically should be cheaper than melamine face chipboard. So the equation changes then, but for the moment um, it's about premium and premium comes with good design. Fantastic. So uh, yeah, thank you so much, Greg. Extremely compelling story and yeah, you, you continue on your growth trajectory. Long, long may that continue. Um, hopefully we've had some interesting questions through so Ed, is that back to you? Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Ben. Thanks very much, Greg. Um, really great to hear your story and how you've actually embedded that into the development of your business. You know, lots of, lots of, um, it brings real life to the sort of the, the concepts that we were talking about earlier. Um, it's, it's generated a lot of questions, a lot of activity um, from people um, listening. And so I'm just gonna, um, ask Marco to select some of the questions if there are things that have come through. Um, as, a, as an opener, I'm just gonna scroll through some of the questions that we've had cropping up across the morning and invite all of our, our speakers this morning to, to respond if that's appropriate. So um, Nick, back when you were introducing this, um, we've got a, an observation from Charles Ross. Um, in textiles, we talk about three types of durability, physical, size, and emotional. Um, and it's the emotion, I think various people have, have touched on this, it's the emotional attachment that we, we establish with, with, with products, which means that we, uh, we keep them or we discard them. Um, so, but there's, so, so any reflections on that strength and how that is, is worked into effectively your, your your value proposition and what you actually offer to the market um, and interesting sort of reflections on what does that mean for how you market that product or that service um, and and a sort of an implicit under undercurrent about will we ever be able to stop the commercial pressure to actually sell more so any reflections on that, on that? Nick any do you want to get, have a stab at that so again in terms of designing an emotionally durable product, um, it's not easy, but it certainly can be done. Um, and I don't have a I don't have a concrete answer, but what I think you know, I, I reflect on the fact that what makes things special to me are, I suppose, personal connections to the items. So as our capacity to do things like mass customization starts to kick in, the more that perhaps I as a consumer feel I have control over the specification of a product, um, I would hope that that would help contribute to emotionally durable products, as well as just longer lasting and, and, and you know, classic design, it's another element. Um, when it comes to 
the commercial pressure to sell more. Well, there's, there's the nub of it. Um, you know, I, I've lost count of the number of studies that have suggested that um, you can make more money by selling less because it's about shifting how you derive value from a particular product. The whole shift it from a one-off transaction of selling you some stuff to a more a, a longer transaction where the true value that the consumer receives from the product is realized over a greater period of time. But it's enormously difficult to do. And we are trying to roll back on 100, 150 years of inexorable drive towards single use products. Um, and another huge challenge in this area is the fact that most of our supply chains are so complex now with so many players that changing one thing um, is not sufficient to unpick the momentum, that linear momentum. How do you sort of curve it round back towards that more circular approach? And all we can do is, I think, take heart from some of the positive examples that exist. Remember that it's perfectly possible to do this. And there are a large number of brands out there that exist by selling sort of durable products that really engage with you. And even marketing it, I, I haven't got the photo to hand, but uh, you know, Le Creuset, Le Creuset, um, I should know, because I've got a couple, you know, they make a point of, is it you know, the last, so, last casserole dish you'll ever need? It, it, was it um, Patek Philip, the watch brand? You know, saying you're not you're not actually buying this watch. You're 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 giving it to your great 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 granddaughter. So, you know, these messages I think are starting to resonate. Uh, yeah, Ben um, Ben Griffin. Um, any any perspectives on sort of the concept of desirability here? I mean, it's more than presumably just look and feel of a thing. Yeah, it's beauty is more than skin deep, as they say. So I think I mean I think that's really a we talk about desirability and it's really a catch-all for those human considerations so um you know certainly the, the look and look and feel of a, of a product is an important aspect of that but equally uh is it useful is it easy to use versus being frustrating is it aspirational does it make you feel good you know the, all of those kind of um kind of intangible uh, and somewhat emotional aspects, I think, of a, of a product or service come into play. And uh, Greg, any, any perspectives on, on the, this question of, how, well, how do you, how do you um, work with the market in order to actually be a profitable business uh, when responding to uh, drivers to to you know, be more profitable, be more commercially successful, sell more, but also do the right thing. Yeah, I, and and we started from a very simple answer to that, which is let's help people make more money, right? Because if 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 you're trying to charge a premium for a product, that's very difficult, because then it's a trade off, right? Do we want sustainable versus cheaper? If we can do both, then you win all the get all hands down all the time, right? Which is why our conversion rate's quite high when we're, we're bidding for projects. Um, and, and instead, our challenge, of course, is education, right? So we put all our marketing effort into educating people. Um, and, and that's all about sort of emotional durability and convincing people that this is a, this is a better thing for the, for the planet. Um, the, but I, but I think, I think the, the key thing for us was finding a proposition that worked economically. It's not always easy to do, but if you can do that, then you're pushing against an open door, right? How would you like to save money and help the environment? And, and if you look at a sort of two by two, sorry, I used to be a management consultant, so I used to think in two by two graphs uh, or, or diagrams, it, it's, it's easy to lose money doing something green. Um, and it, the hardest thing to do is make, some, make money doing something green. And so focusing hard on that has been um, what's helped us to, us to succeed. So we don't do stuff that loses us money, even though it's greener but we find a way to build that greenness into our profitable business, whatever that is, whether it's tables or chairs or, I mean, we've tried servitization, but the market's not ready for it. Always working on that and taking a life cycle cost, right? So it might be a bit more expensive up front, but if you can demonstrate to the customer that over 
a long term, they'll actually save money. That's as good as, I mean, it's a little bit more of a difficult argument, but it's, it's also very helpful to say, look, you are saving money uh, in what we do. So can I chip in there with with uh, just picking up on that mention of servitization there? Um, you know, th this this is a topic we'll be exploring uh, later on uh, with uh, Emma Burlow of Resource Futures. You know, this 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 strong reality that uh, bi the business model can change uh, the, the nature of the products. You know, a servitized model. Uh, a lease model, a rent and return model, you know, the, 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 the business model that one selects um, will have an impact on the materials that will be feasible, for instance, to, to make your product from. Um, I'm, I'm quite close to uh, Isla Bikes, who make children's bikes. One example there is how they're exploring um, a move to a servitized model, you know, obviously children grow uh, over over the years and need a bigger bike um you know it makes sense on the face of it to servitize that model it's it's a it's a journey they're on um but they're seeing how for instance that that can enable a move from aluminium bikes to uh the, the more durable material of stainless steel um which which also creates the most fantastically beautiful products um so yeah business model will impact on the on the product design um, just looking across a number of questions from various people, um, there's, there's a thread running here around um, coming up against challenging mindsets. Um, so this might be on the part of investors, um, other people within your company. Um, it's, there's a, there's a, a thread of, of, of um, thought here going through the questions around how, how do you overcome the uh, profit maximization um, uh, sort of that that is the prime motivator for for the business for the investor um, and until we actually address that um, there's going to be you know, it's, it's very challenging to um, come up with particular approaches or solutions which would from a design perspective be the be the right thing to do um, I'm just wondering if anybody from the panel would like to pick up on that particular perspective. I think there's a bit of human nature here in that we, we, tend to be, we tend to be drawn to the hard numbers, right? And cost of materials and bill of materials and things like that, uh, it's very quantifiable. We can easily see what the additional cost is to us of using material X over material Y or a particular process over another. It's much harder to quantify the value of making a more desirable solution. You know, th there are ways to do it. We know in we know in ourselves that good design has value. That people will pay a premium for a more desirable, less frustrating uh, experience or product that makes them feel better. Um, but I think often when it when it comes down to it in the boardroom it's much harder to you know, balance that equation. We still tend to put more, uh, more weight than we should on the, um, on, on the tangibles rather than the intangibles. I think that's the challenge there. I think perhaps Greg's got some experience of uh, having those conversations. Uh, not much to add, it's, it's a difficult conversation, yeah. It's, it's really difficult to change the course of an oil tanker. You know, we, we've got, geez, what, four, 500 years of, of modern-ish capitalism. And it's, that's an incredible thing to try to change the direction of it. And it's entrenched. Mindsets are entrenched. Most of the people at senior decision-making positions in many of the large companies uh, tend to be, you know, looking around the panel, sort of my sort of age and upwards. And um, these concepts were almost, were barely articulated when we were children, when we were learning our patterns of behavior and more importantly, our patterns of consumption. You know, I've spent the last 20 odd years of my life in some way, shape or form, trying to reduce waste, working towards what I now, only relatively recently understand to be a circular economy out, you know, circular economy. And I still love new things. I still, my heart still flutters a little bit when the, uh, the Amazon van pulls up outside the house. And if it's hard for me to change, I shudder to think how difficult it is for lots of other people to change. But 
it is through strong examples, carefully worked through, and proving, I think, better models of doing things, that ultimately you have to put things into the language um, that senior decision makers understand. It's not easy to do, but we're coming up with more and more good examples and also learning along the way things that don't necessarily work as well. Some ideas are, won't succeed, will fail, but what we've got to try and do is, is as I said, incrementally move that, uh, move that oil tanker from a straight course to a cruising round in a circle. That's not the best analogy, but you know, there you go. Uh, so just looking at some more questions, there's a slightly different question from Rob Elias. Elias. Um, so thinking that they're coming from a technical background and they've worked with designers before, but um, this, this is a question around knowledge transfer and, and sort of being at the cutting edge really. So um, his experience has been that sometimes designers don't have the best knowledge of the materials um, that are out there which might be the best ones to use. Um, and so uh, again, question, sort of responses um, from the panel, I mean, maybe Sally, Greg, you're sort of nodding in some ex uh, experiences. Yeah, can, can I, I, I read that question, I think that's a really good question, in that um, designers um, need to have the right data. So one, one of, when we started working with plastics, we collaborated with Brunel University because they had a testing lab. Um, and this is the engineer in me, but I said to our designers, look, don't just put, put some bullshit numbers into a, your finite element analysis package, whatever it's called, um, just to make it work, right? That's just uh, accept terms and conditions, sort of yeah, blindly push on with the design because it's not accurate. So we went to Brunel and they did the testing in their lab because if you don't know the, the tensile strength, the compressive strength and the modulus of elasticity, you're just guessing what's going to happen to the product, right? And you're not going to design something that stands up, right? In the case of a tabletop, if you get the modulus of elasticity wrong, it looks like a wobble board, right? So <laughs> that's, and that's a massive serviceability fail, right? Now, I'm using a lot of engineering language here deliberately because this is the first part of it is an engineering problem. You've got to know what your materials are. And I used to be a structural engineer, so every table for me is a little bridge, right? So that makes my life easy. But that's, I'm fortunate to have that background or un, you know, unfortunate, it was a horrible period, but nevertheless, um, I, I've got that background that I can bring into that design discussion. So I put a very, uh, when, I, when I'm working with our designer to design something, it's very much a, this is gonna be a bridge in terms of the process. Um, but often the designers are distracted by the aesthetics um, in the first instance and, and a lot less concerned about the technical aspects like the material properties. So I, I think there's a couple of ways to tackle that. Either the designers should get that data first and make that a priority, or those um, manufacturers who are churning out recycle it should have some good statistics around that because, I mean, put it, put it out there for, as public knowledge for designers and then they've got everything they need to work with your product. But if you're trying to push recycle it and you don't know even what its material properties are, um, that's not helping the industry at all, the design industry to close that loop to create the, the circular world. Yeah, I'll just second all that on data. I mean, there are new materials which are plastic-like. They may not be polymeric, but they, you can form them. They are plastic, <laughs> as a verb. Um, and there's not enough information out there. And also with recycler, it's the variability, you know, it's going to change over time. And if we repeatedly recycle, we'll end up with higher and higher recycled content in material. And that, that will be a change over time. And designers and, and you know, do, they need that data. If they don't have it, they're not going to know how it's going to perform long term. I was really interested to go back to this thing that I picked up on last night around longevity and the changing of a product over time. So some polymers and plastics can actually mature over time and their physical properties can improve because of cross-linking or maturation of the, of the network. So uh, that's really intrigued me. I'm thinking, is there an opportunity to take material properties and make them into um, products that, you know, have got better properties over time? You'd become more attached to it if it behaved in a better manner. That will be about function and perhaps not about the aesthetics, but yeah, I mean, I've got an example here. This is a recycled, 50% uh, recycled PET bottle. Um, and when you recycle PET, it starts to discolor a little bit. I don't know if you can see around the neck of the, I want to put a piece of white paper around it, slightly sort of bluey green color. But what the design of this bottle has done has faceted the top of the 
uh, project. And actually it looks, just looks really pretty. And I don't look at the discoloration. I'm just looking at the design of this and how, you know, desirable it is to pick up. So there's a way to get around that, that material change with time with some really clever design. I, I really like this one. So there's, um, as ever in these uh, events and discussions, we've generated more questions than we can answer in the time available, uh, which is great. And so thank you very much, everybody, for, um, for listening this morning and also generating such a, a really great range of questions. Um, we're going to take a short break to allow people to grab some lunch, um, have a comfort break, uh, go and get on with the rest of the work that's probably piling up in the background. Um, and we're going to resume at one o'clock. Um, I think what we can take from uh, this morning is that there are, there's a wealth of discipline as, and approaches that we can put alongside um, uh, the, the kind of the, the existing approaches in terms of generating more insight and more value. Um, and this has you know, been well uh, illustrated by our speakers. This afternoon, we will move to a slightly different scale by looking at some of the the, how this changes businesses practices, how this changes business models, and touching on some of the circular economy principles that we've unpacked this morning. So please come back at one o'clock for that. Um, we will also be now, uh, after that, going into the actual competition details um, with the team from Innovate UK. So if this has piqued your interest, if this is the kind of opportunity space that you see as being relevant to your business, then please join us for that um, unpacking of the competition details. Um, in the meantime, uh, Anita, do you just want to remind people of the meeting mojo that's running in the background over lunchtime? Yes, happy to. Um, so those, thank you so much for people who have already set up their profiles and I can see that you've been logging in and booking meetings, which is fantastic. It's great that you will want to collaborate and um, have meetings together. Do log in and um, check the times that you've booked your meetings, especially those who have booked meetings during the lunch hour, um, confirm the meetings as well. They will take place over video chat. So once you get your confirmation email, if you just follow the link, follow the instructions, you'll be able to have your 15 minute talks. And then we'll see you back um, after the lunch hour. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you to all our panelists. Fantastic conversation this morning. Really enjoyed that and I hope you, uh, everybody listening to that did as well. So um, see you at one o'clock. Thank you everybody. Chromat Group is a UK developer of radiation detectors using novel crystals. Working in the medical, nuclear and security sectors, their growth was dictated to by winning tenders for new contracts. But they wanted to target tenders and new contracts strategically. Using design, they started from the beginning to find a new way to prioritise new business opportunities, which has now changed how they run their research and development. We responded to projects pretty much as a, here's the specification, can you adhere to this specification? We tick the boxes and create the project. We only had bare minimum interaction with key stakeholders. What there isn't in that is an awful lot of back and forth conversation and there isn't an awful lot of control on the part of the companies trying to service those contracts. So essentially what you're looking to do is to create some relationships that are based on a different basis, where you think about where your technology could best be exploited, you find the ideal applications where you're bringing benefit to the end user, and then you're in much more control of how you exploit that in the market space. What you're also trying to do is to connect all of your business goals into your activities on a development level. With Dan's help, we're able to work together and understand the global context map in which Chromic fits. From that, we're able to understand the demand and supply of our business and the gaps that we could bridge. We have been able to identify approaches and methods and tools to initiate 
and ask the right questions to try and change that specification, to try and challenge the specification. There wasn't a single set of assessments that were going on around opportunities that were coming into Chromec. Sometimes things were coming through via a product management side, sometimes they were coming in through technology development, but what there wasn't was a single point of entry where everything got triaged, if you like, and you decided what their relative merits were and what further information needed to be found. And bringing that together and actually developing a, a workflow that let them make assessments and essentially start to populate a roadmap of the opportunities facing them now and the opportunities in the, the mid and long term and then starting to assess which ones they wanted to invest in. I think that was probably the, the key point of value that we brought in the process. One of the things that we try to encourage clients to do is to stop seeing design as a departmental level activity and see it as the communication and the kind of connective tissue between strategy and the other parts of the business. Um, crucially, when you start to think about it like that, you start to see it as a way of bringing opportunities to the business to invest in. One of the key deliverables and the tangibles that we can see now is that we've got our uh, design innovation suite, which, uh, which is a room which was just a, previously just a standard meeting room with tables in, dingy lighting. So what we've been able to do is to transform that to set it up so that it, it encouraged collaborative working, working on whiteboards, very much visualization. Now it's a very good place that we go if we're trying to work through a problem and help us realize that it's not just a thing for the designer, it's a thing for the, for the way that the whole company can work. Previously people thought design was just design in a pretty box, but since seeing this room and the permanence of it and, understand, and, and seeing the, the workings on, on the boards and, and the steps that we take to define projects, not only just projects, but where Chrome actually sits in the product development chain, it's part of the business model. It's part of the, the innovation in the business. It's part of the, it's part of the foundations of a business. So, welcome back, everybody. Uh, I hope you had a, a good break, time to grab something to eat. <clears throat> you might have been um, watching some of the videos over lunchtime that we have uh, put up just on a loop. These were cases of companies who had been um, supported by Innovate UK funding to, to use design to really explore um, new ways of developing products and services. Um, just two examples there, but hopefully gave a little bit of flavour of what we do and how we can help businesses through using human-centred design. Um, they weren't specifically chosen in relation to plastics and sustainable plastics, but just to give a broad flavour of the nature of uh, design support that's, that's, a, that's uh, the opportunity there. Um, just checking in with everybody, Anita, are you uh, there to kick us off for this afternoon and support us? Certainly. Thanks very much, Thanks. Ed. So welcome Thanks. back, everybody. Um, we're going to be resuming the webinar again um, in a moment. Just before we do, just a little reminder to um, ensure that if you have any questions around the content and um, the topics that are being spoken about at the panel discussions and presentations, just um, sending your questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And um, that will be wonderful. And then we will read them out and then get them answered. And also, if you want to collaborate and you want to share details about yourself with everybody, um, use the chat box for that. It's also found at the bottom of the screen. Just click on the chat box and then select send to all panelists and attendees. And then everybody will be able to see all the wonderful information. And um, yeah, just any other just general comments. Um, if you all have problems with your sound or any visuals, also put those in the, in the chat box. The Q&A box will be just for questions. So enjoy the afternoon, grab a tea and coffee and have a good fun. Great, thanks Anita. <clears throat> so we're going to, uh, I've just put up the agenda again, so just to refresh what we're going to cover this afternoon. Um, so shortly we'll be talking to Ryan and Sally um, around, uh, again, another example from a company who's really implementing this and looking at how they have absorbed and really using um, the application of, of design within their business to, to generate more uh, value and new opportunities within uh, the markets that they're aiming for. 
Um, we'll then turn to talk to Emma and Ben around um, kind of resource efficiency and designing new business models. Um, so that would be uh, great as well, looking at some of those perhaps more systemic um, change issues that we were talking about this morning. Um, we'll then have a brief session for, for Q&A, because I'm sure that will um, create a number of questions for you. Um, so again, posing those back to the panellists. And then um, around about quarter to two, we'll um, hand over to Gavin and Izzy to actually outline the scope and eligibility criteria and details of the forthcoming competition at the start of next month um, around designing sustainable plastics. Uh, so um, with a view to aim at aim to finish by about half past two. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. I'm going to um, invite Ryan and Sally um, to pass it. I'm going to pass over the mic to, to Sally, who will be in, in effect interviewing Ryan on the on his experiences um, at, as the, at the helm of Pity Plea. Thank you very much, Ed. <clears throat> Hi, Ryan. Good to see you again. Um, Hello. You know, face to face last time, as I guess many people Hello. did, but yeah, hopefully face to face again at some point. Um, so the reason that we wanted you to talk is to sort of share your experience, um, and this is in a build up to to what Gavin from Innovate UK will be saying about the competition, how you might access public funding. Obviously, if you could start with a sort of brief introduction of your company and what you do and that mega fantastic light bulb idea that I, I think is really neat. But really, if you can share your sort of story as to how you found, you know, pluses and minuses of applying for funding and, and how you've got to where you've got with the support that you've had from, from Innovate UK and others. Absolutely. Um, would you actually, I, I did put a put together a presentation and Arabella, my colleague, uh, who's CEO at Petit Pli is also here to answer any questions. Would you like me to, to go through the, some visuals as well? That would be brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, Arabella and I spoke yesterday and she said you'd share some slides from your screen. So. Amazing. Uh, so can everyone see that? Yes. Awesome. Uh, so hi, I'm Ryan, uh, founder and CEO of Petit Pli, and I'm joined today with Arabella, uh, who will go over more on the details of the competitions. Uh, so the fashion industry is the world's second largest polluter after oil and gas, and we already know what the solution is for that, and that is to extend the life and use of our clothes. So a few years ago, my sister had another child, uh, Vigo, and I had sent him some clothes from London to Denmark, but by the time they had arrived, he actually didn't fit in them. So that made me realize as a signal uh, that children grow seven sizes in their first two years on earth, which is absolutely crazy. Uh, so by focusing on a very niche user group, I was able to design a garment that grows with them uh, through those seven sizes. Uh, the design is now patent pending in, in various countries. And uh, yeah, this is how it works essentially, very simple. So if we look at the entire value chain, it actually has positive impact everywhere. So, so from the material, yes, we use recycled fabrics, which is great. But the interesting stuff is, is in the manufacturing process, which is much more streamlined. So you're creating uh, one size instead of seven discrete sizes. So you have uh, less waste typically. It's also um, capturing value from the end of life of that product and, and injecting that value back into the labor so that we can afford to use factories which have much more ethical practices and also are much more innovative. Uh, for retailers managing inventory, it's just so much easier to manage one size versus seven. If you imagine if you have seven sizes and various different styles and having to carry those all around and just manage that stock is very difficult. Um, from an e-commerce perspective as well, we have fewer returns, which has also positive impact on the bottom line of the business, but also uh, fewer CO2 emissions from unnecessary logistics. So people will often buy multiple sizes and return the ones that don't fit. And then for users, we're trying to just give them a desirable way to be sustainable. So um, how can we make sustainability the, the cooler option essentially? So our, our garments use durable water repellents and they have a ripstop structure to make them last as long as possible and be really durable. Uh, a byproduct of the patent pending structure is also the complete freedom of motion and agility. And it's really practical. So often children's wear is gifted, um, like in my case, uh, but often that also goes to waste. But if you know that you're buying something that's practical and that it'll definitely fit, it, it just makes it easier to make that more positive um, purchase decision. So how did we get here? 
Um, I have a background in aeronautical engineering where I specialized in deployable structures for nanosatellites at Imperial College. I then went to the Royal College of Arts and uh, was so intrigued by the world of fashion and how you could uh, harness so much power um, through communities and what they wore and how you could proliferate messages through that and also how you could act on an individual scale and you know inspire someone to be confident just because of the different t-shirt they were wearing. Um, so I was really intrigued by it but the more I dug into it the more I realized that it was a really unethical and wasteful industry. So I realized that the solution that I had to come up with had to be ethical and sustainable because um, that was the main goal but it to be a real project and, and live outside of a university portfolio piece, it also had to be really desirable and commercially viable. Uh, and by focusing on children's wear, that challenge was, was much more easy to manage. Uh, so uh, began prototyping with different structures, embedding shape memory alloys within the fabric so you could actuate it and see what would work. Uh, then went really lo-fi and just thought, okay, if I'm just sketching this out, this is essentially a sketch with my nephew and my niece. And I was able to show this image at a very early stage to parents and say, hey, wh what do you think of this idea? Does it have legs? Um, should I pursue it? And then all of the initial feedback was so important into shaping the way uh, this project then evolved. Um, so desirability, if we just focus on that for, for the couple of minutes that we have left. Uh, it's really easy to design for ourselves, but it gets really challenging when you're designing for others. So the things that you have to do for behavior changes, one of them is uh, observe and immerse yourself in that world. So we often hear the words, you'll grow into it. We would probably heard it all of us uh, as a child, and we'll probably say it to children in the future. Uh, and I think that this is something that was accepted as a, as a norm, but it's not something that we ever questioned because we always grew up with it from the very beginning. So what if you detach yourself from that process and, and start to look at everything objectively and you begin to realize that, you know, the world shouldn't be the way it necessarily is and it, and it can be different um, and you can design to improve. Uh, so soon after launching the soft launch where we sold 100 beta test units, we also employed human centric design methodologies again. So uh, after six to nine months, we asked people for their feedback so that they could essentially co-design the garment. So they filled out a 45 minute feedback form. This is after purchasing the garment. But then in return for their feedback, we would iterate the design, improve it, and then give them a second version um, for free. Uh, the reason being that we wanted their real constructive criticism to, to really take this to the next step. Uh, testimonials. So, so the testimonials were really positive um, and we got some really interesting insights from that. I think the most interesting one was the magic trick and how we were creating magic for children through their clothes and inspiring them to think uh, more sustainably or, or less wastefully. And I think that that was a really cool nugget of gold, which we, we totally didn't design for. Um, so another aspect of designing for behavior change is understanding the opportunities and barriers. So sustainability is often seen as not the advanced option. So it's usually uh, degraded material which has been recycled and so it doesn't perform as well as the virgin material. Um, but what if you paired innovation and sustainability into a single product? Maybe you could influence those design decisions and also break that preconception that sustainable is uh, worse quality. Um, another aspect is uh, parents would sometimes come back and say I would never dress my child in polyester because it's plastic but then you know you ask them why they have a plastic spoon which they feed their child from or a plastic raincoat and so then it would you know help shift the the way we design the object to be not necessarily an underwear garment but more an outerwear garment so giving it those technical properties and, and creating a good value proposition um, the right material in the right place makes total sense and, and someone else mentioned earlier that plastic shouldn't necessarily be villainized um, it's just, it's misuse of plastic, which is, which is bad. Um, so new parents are at a point in their lives where their habits are drastically changing as well. And this is a perfect opportunity to inspire them to change their habits and also inspire them to proliferate those learnings to the next generation, i.e. their children. Uh, so if we're designing for behavior change, social norm is also a huge thing. Um, so we're very heavily influenced by those around us. And so by arming our customers with information, with a care booklet that we provide with every garment, we give them the sort of reasoning to defend the brand, to defend their decision, to 
to essentially educate them as well as the next generation. So I think by taking all of these different approaches, um, human-centric design is so powerful for inspiring behavior change for the better. Um, and I think it's, it's something that is, is really beneficial to any design process. So we're continuing to go direct to consumer for that actual reason. Um, we want to maintain a conversation with people uh, and continue to get their feedback before we go to retailers or wholesalers, which may filter out crucial information at this stage. It's also really important to understand that you're not just designing for the end user, you're also designing for the entire supply chain. So taking the manufacturer as an example, we want you know, them to do a more complex thing. We want them to produce fewer of them. And then uh, we have to convince them that that is a better design choice for them as well. Why? Because um, they're going to be building knowledge and future-proofing their business. They're going to be um, obtaining a higher price per unit, a more efficient process, so less waste in the long run. Um, and it means that their labor can be paid even better. Um, and then if we're also reshifting the value perception of clothing, of the, these are the most intimate products that we own, our clothes. We wear them every day, they're on our skin, but we would rather spend three pounds on, on them in many cases than invest in a more expensive garment that can achieve more things. Um, but if we can reshift that value perception, then we can have a really positive knock-on effect on the industry in the long term. So what if we could inspire the next generation? And, and that's something that's really key to what Pity Plea is. We are a wearable technology company. We want to design for the future of humanity, but we're just starting with the next generation. That's, that's our goal. Um, and I have got Arabella, who's got a couple of slides here on the, on the competition process. So I'll just pass on to her now. Hi there. Um, I'll just whip through these quickly as I know we're pressed for time. So uh, at the end of 2017, uh, the company was really young. We just uh, were essentially a student project um, which was entering R&D and moving the MVP to a commercialized scale product. So uh, fortunately, what with innovation being integral and core to particularly long-term vision to create the future of humanity, the design foundations competition uh, opened up at a suitable time. Um, it was aimed for early stage companies with um, really great um, uh, catalyzing ideas which use human-centered design. And then through that, we had a three month feasibility project and we were able to use the IP from that project and apply it to a second larger award, if you could press the slide, Brian. Uh, the really exciting Sky Oceans Ventures and Plastics Pollution Accelerator Program, the first of its kind with Innovate UK, which was a 12 month industrial project. And through that, uh, we were able to not only apply uh, the learnings from the Design Foundations uh, project, but we were also able to utilize and the networks that we created off the back of uh, the KTN events uh, through Design Foundations. Uh, one thing that we should really, really communicate is the fact that these competitions are, were entirely different in scope. And also the stage of the company was entirely different. If you could uh, press the next slide. Um, ahead of applying, uh, you, any company, any individual, any consortium, I think really needs to take a self-assessment to see, to understand whether they, A, have the cap capacity to apply for the project, but B, their, their idea is actually indeed in scope. To check if it is in scope, KTN is there for you. Uh, Brian McCarthy was there for Ryan when he was a student. Sally's been really supportive um, with Sky. And then also Ben Griffin has been um, supportive of uh, the TP throughout our history with Innovate UK. And it's through all these really great competitions and um, just doing that due diligence and seeing if we were eligible, if the project was in scope and really doing that due diligence that we were able uh, to fortunately receive these competitions. Awesome. Well, thanks to both of you. I'm sorry I haven't had time to ask any more questions, really, because um, I know we go to the next speaker, but it's really clear that you've taken your consumers, your customers along the journey with you, and that's allowed you to make any of your changes with them in mind, which is really important. And then from the flip side, Arabella, just working with your funders as well uh, and organisations that can support you is really valuable. So thank you to you both. Back to you, Ed.
Yeah, thank you. That's fantastic and, and, and such a great story um, behind the development of those ideas and those concepts to market. Fantastic. Um, so thanks, guys, for, for, for showing us that. I think that will generate a lot of questions, actually. So we'll save those for the moment. Uh, we'll now move to, to Ben and Emma. Um, and I think some of the things that you touched on, Ryan, there in terms of building up the business is also about the supply chain and looking at the business as a whole. Yeah. Um, and Emma and Ben, that is something that we wanted to cover uh, as well in terms of looking at new business models in this space. So um, over to you, uh, Emma and Ben. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ed. And uh, welcome, Emma, from Resource Futures, a, a consultancy based down in, um, in Brighton Way. Um, Emma, do you want to say a few words about Resource Futures before we sort of dive into the, the topic of business model innovation? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Bristol, Bristol way rather than Bristol. Brighton, we are, we are all yeah, covered over the UK. I've got a team in Scotland as well. Um, so yeah, we're essentially a waste resources uh, consultancy with about 30 year heritage. So we were, we were formed uh, by a merger of, of other companies many years ago. Um, so we, we, we've got a really good team in terms of evidence around waste, end of waste, right through waste services for local authorities, uh, right through to the team that I lead, which is circular economy working with uh, businesses and the public sector on this sort of transition towards uh, more circular business models. So we did a lot of work for, um, for DEFRA around some of their policy around plastic um, and also for Zero Waste Scotland delivering their circular economy uh, support behind their fund. Um, and also for, for the Welsh government around their circular economy fund. So we're sort of tapped into a lot of the um, you know, business support, but also doing some more bespoke work for larger brands and that sort of thing on circular economy so quite quite a broad church but i think the the, the unique factor about resource futures is we've we've kind of kind of got our hands on the waste so we actually do hands-on waste composition analysis as well as the circular stuff so we can you know give companies um or governments that evidence that data that they need so that's really well Thank you. Yeah, so great to have you with us, Emma. Um, so what do we mean when we talk about a business model, the, the business model and business model innovation, if you like? How is that relevant and important when we're trying to tackle this, this, this mm. challenge of, of, of reducing plastic waste? Yeah, I think a lot of people instantly when you think about design, you, you kind of think about product design. But really, the, the space that I tend to do a lot of work in is around the business model itself. Um, and people will be familiar with things like uh, leasing or repair or remanufacture. Um, but it's really a different case when you try and apply that to, a, to what is usually a very linear business. So, you know, the majority of businesses are constructed and are measured in a linear fashion. So they make things, they sell them um, to, to a customer and then they make another thing and they sell it to probably a different customer. Um, and so trying to engineer something circular into an, circular into that is, is going against the grain so businesses understandably find it difficult so you sometimes end up with these kind of bolt-on projects and what we're trying to do is to work with companies who who accept that there's a massive need for this and b massive opportunities to redesign the way they work and redesign the way they deliver their products or service um, because it doesn't have to be I mean it's a bit like Ryan said it doesn't have you know you don't have to buy clothes in that way we can re we can design our way out of this um, so it's about gathering the evidence for them and you know that's some of the support we can give but right at the beginning it's about helping them see through a different lens that they can still deliver their product but it may well be that they can deliver it in a in a way that is a more sustainable and b probably better for them in the long run in terms of their you know their returns and their profitability great so uh, yeah you, you've mentioned a few of the the kind of business models we're talking about so there's there's, there's servitization, we had allusion to that earlier, hiring, yeah. leasing, and so on. Do you, can you say a little bit more about the different types of business model and perhaps uh, yeah. throw in some examples along the way briefly? Yeah, sure. So people will probably be familiar with the, the so-called butterfly diagram, which, which talks about the, you know, the different business models and the sort of closer, the, the smaller that circle can get, the closer you get towards a cl what we call a closed loop. Um, business model the better the better in sustainability terms or is it in resource use terms but there's actually kind of a plethora of of, of business models that, that really follow the the age-old kind of waste hier hierarchy around reduce reuse recycle so before you get into any of the kind of complexity 
you know, all businesses should, should be, or we could put it another way, no product should now be being designed without um, a nod to those principles, you know, um, so that, and that still happens, you know, products are still designed without any sort of foresight as to their, even their basic recyclability. So reduce, reuse really at the top of the hierarchy. So if you, if you're starting to think about how you might reduce resource use, then you're going to be looking at models like leasing, so that that product um, will be leased rather than sold, so it won't be a one-off sale. Um, and you, then you're starting to look at repairability, durability, maintenance models, that sort of thing, which offer massive opportunities because you're basically selling a service around your product. So you need to shift, you know, from those, uh, from that sort of um, obsession, if you like, around recycling to actually these other business models, which actually offer greater leverage in terms of getting your customer to buy additional services off you. So there's a real uh, commercial advantage to customer loyalty. So those models on the, that, that, that tend to be sort of overlooked a bit more about servitization, leasing, repair, uh, remanufacture, all enable you to get your customer back, which is absolutely, you know, the holy grail for most businesses. So, um, so you mean that there's plenty of text and, you know, and, and sort of um, work been done on, on the different business models, but, but essentially if you stick to the principles of, of how do we res re reduce resource use, how could we reuse our, our, our product or how could our customers reuse our product? Um, how do we recycle it at end of life? Then you're going to capture most of those in there and all the other sort of business models go, you know, fit around those, those principles, principles. Right. So, yeah, on, we've kind of. Sorry, you asked me on... some examples, Ben. Sorry. Didn't yeah. Do you want Do you want to go into a couple more? Oh, let's have a think. Um, companies. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a couple of exa examples. Um, I mean, we we talked about Airbnb Ben the other day in terms of you know sharing economy. So that's the sharing economy is a classic example of a of a circular business model that doesn't really know it's a circular business model. So you know they weren't set up with circularity in mind. Um, so, you know, that's a really good example. We're not building a new hotel to put loads of people in. We're using, you know, excess um, assets that are lying empty. Um, so that's a good example of, of maybe, you know, the sharing economy. And, and there are plenty of other ones around, around co-cars and zip cars and all those sorts of things. Um, leasing is, is something that's been around for ages. So most people lease their phones. 85% of cars are now sold on lease. And yet for lots of businesses, leasing still feels very difficult. Um, and there are lots of reasons around that. It goes in you know, a different place on the balance sheet and all the rest of it. But rental, I mean, rental's as old as the ARC. So actually we can, we can apply very traditional business models. It doesn't have to seem niche and high risk. It's just that lots of things you wouldn't have thought of renting years ago when, we were, when, when life was all about consumables you know, and disposables and, and that sort of thing. So it's about just changing your lens a bit and saying, well, why have I bought this? Maybe I could have rented it from a consumer point of view, but more importantly, from a business point of view. Um, uh, and, you know, really starting to understand your market. I'm actually looking at leasing around white goods at the moment with a white goods manufacturer um, for the social housing market. Um, so that's another example of white goods. So in the Netherlands, there's a company called Bundles who lease white goods quite successfully. The timing's not quite been right in the UK, but but I do think that that time will come, especially with smart, especially with smart machines, where you want to be upgrading your machine rather than, you know, you'll be getting information um, upgrades and that sort of thing. Um, so, so that's great. So you you refer there to um, the central importance of understanding your market, and that mm. that maybe brings me on to this this question. Um, that, that I've got in mind, what is the relationship between the development of the business model and this, this notion of design? You know, earlier on in the day, we talked about what, what is design. Um, yeah, what, mm. what, do you, what do you think the relationship is there between design and, and uh, business model innovation? God, it's, a, it's absolutely key. I'd say it's probably one of the main areas that I see, I don't like to talk about failure, but where you see failure is where the innovator hasn't understood their market and they you know they may have come up with a brilliant idea that they think is a great idea and and, and their friends might think it's a great idea and their family but but it, it it drops like a stone when you put it out in the market particularly the mainstream market i'm talking about there are some innovations that work well in in the dark green side of the spectrum but 
if you're talking about a mainstream market, it really has to sit very well against a competitive product. So something like Ecover, for example, has achieved that. You know, it sits on the supermarket shelf at the right price point for the general consumer to buy. And yet, you know, the, the amount of R&D and circularity in that business is, is, is vast. So, yeah, the user interface is really important. And I think Ryan said it, you, you need to get critical feedback to, to put into your design. You need to actually take the criticism rather than the positive feedback, which is very easy to give. Um, so it's quite hard to, to, to do that, but you almost, ha you, know, you almost have to think about the worst case situation um, before you can you know, hope that that product's gonna, gonna land. One of the things I try and say to people is to find the, pay, you know, find the pain point, find the problem you're trying to solve, and then your solution needs to offer people a pain-free alternative, and that's really hard because you know if it was that easy lots of people were doing it but but there are examples toast ale is a great example of a, 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 a you know business and a, a born on circularity that has managed to you know take away the pain point of, of food waste and create a great product that now sits on the shelves alongside traditional linear products so so it can be done by looking at some of those examples but you have to understand your market. Toastdale have hit it exactly perfectly right. They understand their market, what they want to buy, right price point, that sort of thing. Yeah, so I, I, I guess I'm concluding that uh, we should consider the development of the business model as part of the discipline of design. Um, part of what you yeah. said there brings me on to what I think will be my final question. Um, Clive Grinier earlier was talking about the central importance of building a prototype, you know, testing your assumptions. Are you asking mm. the right questions and so on? Mm. You know, check it's the right, it really is a problem that you're solving. Um, <laughs> yeah, prototyping is, is a principle. You know, those same things are, are, are essential when you're developing your business model, presumably, yeah? Yeah, yeah. The, only, the difference I would make, I would say is that um, so we often get questions, and I saw one on the chat, you know, people are looking for an alternative to their packaging, say, or an alternative product, an alternative way to deliver something, um, a product. Um, and I would say the, the main difference it, with circularity is because of the business model, uh, it, because of the business model element, you're going to need to actually look outside of just your product design team. So it's going to be a logistics issue. It's going to be a sourcing issue it's going to be a, a marketing issue um, and actually so you can't um, you can't design in a vacuum you know so and I, and I know that's the same of any design but I think it's more pertinent here because you're going to probably going to need an enabler so you cannot design you know you cannot hope to design reusable refillable packaging for example without a major shift in in probably the whole business so it's almost you know that's 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 the big difference it's are you designing a model or are you designing a product? And if you design the product without the model, that you've then got another hurdle to get over. So we've designed this brilliant, you know, rental gadget, widget, but how are we going to get it to people? You know, how, oh, well, we can, you know, and then you start having to sort of subcontract that and then that adds on cost. And that's where things get a little bit disjointed. So to go back to sort of, you know, the examples that we've given where the, where the whole business is is working around a, you know circularity that's where these things the whole business starts to redesign itself so I, I suppose that's my sort of takeaway is that if you're trying to work on something and you feel like it's a bit of a bolt-on it probably is <laughs> yeah. and, and that's going to be harder work yeah great yeah so yeah great great uh, messages there uh, and to summarize yeah let, let the the design of the product and the business model sing in in harmony yeah they have um, to. yeah mm. okay so back to you ed uh, uh, yeah again hopefully we've got some questions come in from the audience yeah fantastic thank you emma um that was that was a really good unpacking of what can seem sometimes a difficult set of conceptual issues to get into yeah. but that was that was great um before we just go to q and a i've, I've got one question that sort of links your presentations and I invite our audience just to put some more Q&A in the box if there's things that people want to talk about. But you both, Ryan and Emma, um, you, you both mentioned a relationship with your, um, with your consumers, with your customers mm -hmm. as changing. 
um, mm. and you, you learnt different things from that. Um, just expanding that a bit, did you find what were the insights that you have learnt in terms of changing relationships with other people in your supply chain as well? How have you, 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 you both mentioned that, but do you have any sort of, in, you've got learnings and insights from your consumers, from your customers, but have you generated learnings and insights from other people in your supply chain and how you might move with them or then move with you? Because this is all about you know, a, a broader approach than mm. just the specific thing. Interested in your reflections on that. Mm. Right, um, the go yeah. as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so it, at the beginning, we first had a decentralized supply chain uh, based here in the UK. Um, it involved uh, different factories um, doing different bits of work to assemble the garment. Um, and it was good. There were lots of challenges required for that. Logistically, it was very difficult. Uh, we then moved it to a centralized supply chain in Portugal that could manage the entire thing under one roof. Uh, not only that, but they were really well aligned with our values. So really innovative as a company, uh, really ethical. So they had like gyms for all of their employees and so on. Um, and uh, they derive a third of their energy from solar panels. So um, I think uh, it's always been a conversation and there are so many challenges and hurdles uh, required um, at every stage because there are so many different constraints to the capabilities and the equipment available. So it's really about um, having conversations with them, working with them, and and feeling more like your partners rather than they are uh, oh, someone who should do something for you when you pay them. Um, it's more about this is the challenge. Okay, I recognize that you're finding it hard to do this. I recognize that you're also putting in the investment and the time to 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 take us a small company on board, which is costly to you. So let's let's work together to, to figure this out. It's very much about value alignment. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there any yeah, that's that's that? all. That's all I would add. Ed, really, is is just exactly that. It's about value alignment. You, you know, you, you, this will only work if you find like-minded, you know, suppliers. And and I, I have worked with companies who have fabulous, you know, designs, but are really struggling to get, you know, the raw materials or at least the raw materials in a in anything that could be called ethical or. Um, sustainable state you know so that so sometimes there's a little bit of finding somebody who wants to go on that journey with you and that's a bit more than a contractor supplier relationship as Ryan said um, but I think you need to you need to accept that you're gonna to have to nurture that and there's almost a bit you know there's a lot more give and take I think than there would be in a traditional contractual relationship you know there's going to be and I worked with Pozu the shoe company quite, through the Rebus project actually um, and they had this with their supplier in Portugal, you know, there was a lot of toing and froing around, could we do repair? And, you know, you need them for cost figures and you know them to, to build up that picture. You need a lot of transparency. You also need them to sort of say, well, we're on this journey with you. It might not work. And that, that's quite a difficult thing to do in a contractual relationship. So there is a lot more mindedness and, and, and almost trust that goes into it. Um, but the, but the, but the benefit of that is enormous because you will both come on in leaps and bounds and both be in such a more positive position at the end of it. So if you find a company who, who is on the same page, then, you know, it, 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 it's brilliant. Um, but it's not, it's not always an open market, just go and, you know, go onto Alibaba and you'll be able to find it. It's a bit different. I mean, these, these sorts of groups are great for that, about finding people who will accept this is not a six month thing. I'm not going to be able to put an order in, in three, in a year, you know, we're going to need to go on a journey. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, going to the total opposite end of the spectrum now, going <laughs> to a, a quite a specific materials question um, from Eric Lathgueth. Um, could we compare uh, bio, biodegradable polymer versus bamboo um, in terms of uh, the manufacturing processes using adhesives? Um, so I think, I th think talking about product life cycle and the ease of disassemblability, I think. Um, so perhaps a question, Emma or Sally, um, to, to respond to that. So any thoughts on the comparison between bamboo and biogradable polymer? Well, the adhesives thing is, is throws a, you know, an immediate kind of spanner in the works, not, not, you know, you need to fully understand how that adhesive operated, obviously. But can you, you know, this is a really good question, actually, because there's a lot of apples and pears 
deliberation going around, you know, going around. And I think, you know, one of the biggest things that's happening for us at the moment is, is the, the circularity debate and the carbon debate. And, and thrown into that almost out, of, you know, not out of the blue, but was the plastics debate and then the biodegradability. So it's really important when I talk about looking through this lens that you kind of decide which direction you're pointing in and what's important to you. And if, you know, if carbon, if, 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 sorry, if plastic, marine plastic is important to you, then you might be looking down a, a different road than if carbon is different, more important to you. Now, if you, you can have both, and that, that's, that's like the holy grail, but you need to decide, you know, where, you, where you're going. And with biodegradability and bamboo, I, again, you'd need to look at those and say, what is the purpose of this product? You know, how long do I want it to last? What's its resource? Uh, what's it, you know what's its embodied carbon without being able to go into massive detail of that you, you almost can't answer those questions because it depends on its application the length of its use phase you know i would rather maybe have something that's bamboo that lasted 20 years than something that was biodegradable that lasted 10 minutes but if that's um something that's disposable then i don't want it to last 20 years i want it to be disposable and then therefore i'd need it to be biodegradable i i have major kind of um, alarm bells around the, the biodegradability world at the moment because we need to be much much better at communicating to the consumer about what they do with those items but that that's almost a separate issue we're a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of being able to communicate those things so all I could say is it's a horrible it depends answer but it completely depends on the application because what I do see sometimes is people kind of substituting for this almost for the sake of it and i understand that that is because plastic is the is the end game there but you know in terms of circularity a biodegradable resource has to go back into a chain for it to be circular and at the moment you know we're not we're not good enough at that um so that you know there's no point in a biodegradable item ending up in landfill mm -hmm. that's counterproductive i suppose my comments are sort of material based in that often lots of dissimilar materials or not the same homogeneous material is used in a product because you want different functionality but it, it, it's potentially possible to find adhesives that would be compostable in the same manner maybe over a different time period than the so there's the matrix and then there's the adhesive that holds it together you know you could use cellulosic adhesives with a cellulosic um, wood fiber and I think Levi's have just brought out a gene that instead of having rivets and zips and leather patches have made all the components from cellulose based materials so that the whole garment at the end of the day is just one material. It just has different properties of those different functionalities just by the way that they've manufactured or used that base material. So, you know, working towards something that's maybe has complexity, but with a better endpoint because you've you've essentially used one material type to get different functionality would be something that I see in that question not necessarily answering directly compostable versus not compostable. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to take one last question because uh, I'd like to move to the actual competition details and give enough time for that. Um, interesting question from Chris Sherwin. Hi Chris, hope you're well. Um, on do different um, circular economy or sustainable um, solutions require us to change how we design. Um, so what, what do we need to take on board in terms of design process, um, design, uh, not design thinking, but the way that we think about design. So open question to all um, panelists there, particularly interested in those who I are sort of applying, applying it in, in companies. Yeah, I think that'd be a great question for Chris Sherwin, actually. <laughs> As a design, so I'm not a designer, I don't purport to be a designer, but um, I think it goes back to this point about having to take in a lot more information, and um, particularly around circularity. I think one of the challenges I see is that a lot of the innovators that I work with are almost trying to design their product or their service with very limited input of information, so particularly around end of life. So you know, I think it's, I think I should say to most companies, just, just assume that you, you can't, you cannot know what happens to your product at its end of life. You cannot assume anything at the moment and start from that position. 
because so many people presume that a biodegradable product will be bio, you know, will be composted somewhere, or they presume that a PET bottle will be recycled. But there's, there are, you know, there are lots and lots of st different statistics to, to suggest that they won't, it won't. So you need to somehow get some end of life um, information, some either, either a consumer, um, you know, testing, what would you do with it? Well, I don't know, I don't know what to do with it, so I'd put it in the bin. Oh, really? Wouldn't you recycle it? Well, no, because I'm out on the road or whatever. So getting that consumer feedback, but also get, get down to the level, I mean, co-op did this with the biodegradable bags, down to the level of the individual council, so they don't supply the biodegradable bags in areas where they know the councils don't provide um, uh, curbside food collection, compost collection, for example, which I think is, is, a, is a really responsible step forward. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, there's potentially a lot more homework that you have to do around the outside to, to, put, that, to put that data in. And I touched on carbon, but, you know, it is, it is a necessary evil that people try to establish whether or not their sustainable model actually has a higher or a lower carbon footprint than the disposable model that they're trying to replace. Mm. Any, any other perspectives on that? Uh, I just agree. Uh, just taking a really holistic approach and understanding all the knock-on effects uh, up and down um, the chain is just super important. Uh, and I think uh, a way a way to to build a, a high resolution understanding of the challenge is also to have a really multidisciplinary approach so either within if you're working on it on your own having you know different interests or if you're a team having uh, experts in different fields that can all uh, vouch from their um, corner of the room um, and give their expertise Thanks. All good points. The, I mean, the the multidisciplinarity of the of the pursuit is something um, that is I hope implicitly implicitly come across through all these conversations. But I think is something that is quite explicit in terms of certainly the what Innovate UK are trying to um, catalyze for the opportunities to come together for different communities and different disciplines to actually work together, um, which is probably a nice seeking into. Um, Gavin and uh, Izzy to talk us through the competition. So thank you very much, Ryan and Emma and Sally, thank you. Um, for your contributions this afternoon. It's great to uh, hear those stories. It's generated a lot of discussion. Um, if I can uh, invite Gavin and Izzy to um, take up the presentation. I think, Gavin, you have some slides to show us around the competition. And we'll spend the next... Uh, Got about three quarters of an hour until we close at half past two. What we'll do is run through the details, but if we can leave around 15 minutes or so for a QA, um, that would be that would be desirable. Over to you. Okay. Me, Thanks, Ed. Hopefully you're seeing my slides on my notes. Is that uh, correct? Okay. So uh Yes, so I'm uh, Gavin Lewis. I'm an innovation lead working for Innovate UK. I actually spend most of my time working on smart, sustainable plastic packaging, but today we're here to talk about designing sustainable plastic solutions, which is broader than plastic packaging. It's absolutely part of the research and innovation fund called PRIF. If I can just get my uh, presentation to work, there we go. So just a quick intro to where Innovate uh, UK is and where it came from. So uh, Innovate UK sits as part of UKRI, UK Research and Innovation, which uh, is basically an amalgamation of um, six research councils, the Science and Technology Facilities Council, Research England and Innovate UK, and those were all pulled together in 2018 to form UKRI. It's the agency through which the UK government funds research and innovation in the UK and it's in roughly investing around £7 billion pounds a year. Innovate UK, like I said, sits within that now. And Innovate UK is really more about co-funding business-led innovation. So it's uh, more of a narrow focus and we work with organisations of all shapes and sizes to try and deliver sustainable growth. Since 2007, it's funded over 11,000 projects, 
uh, and invested over 2.5 billion pounds. And I think for every one of those pounds, it's returned six to seven. So it's doing quite well. So today's conversation, designing sustainable plastic solutions. And um, first, just a little recap on human-centered design that you've heard a lot today from the folks that are using it, um, and, and they're using it very well, a lot of them. So uh, the term was originally coined by IDEO in the States, a design and innovation company. And it's all about understanding people's needs, whether those people are the end users or right the way along the chain, essentially. Uh, and you're looking to be able to provide vastly improved solutions by a deep and by having a deep understanding of those needs. If you want all of the information about the concept, the tools, the techniques, etc., uh, you can go to designkit.org and you will find all of it there. Gavin, just as you, I'm sorry to interrupt your flow, sure. but is there, is there a way to make your slides slightly larger? I think people are having difficulty reading the smaller text on those. All ah, right, okay. Um, and I'm on there. To be honest, Ed, the way that I've got it set up at the moment, I'm not entirely sure that it is. Um, <laughs> Okay, shall we, shall we proceed? If somebody's got a, a fantastic shortcut to that, to that, how to do it, can you put it in the chat, please? Thank you. Okay. Um, so the competition itself opens on the 1st of June and it runs until the 16th of September. It's a total pot of £800,000 and we're looking for UK registered businesses that can share, uh, that can have, a, have an early stage project around human centered design and uh, is focused on reducing plastics harm to the environment whilst also creating a sustainable new business. Uh, the applications can be collaborative or individual um, and subcontracting is allowed. So if you're a business that has design capability in-house and wants to fund their work that you can't do in other ways to, to, to try and come up with a solution in line with this competition or if you're a company that has an idea and wants to work with a design business to help you realize that idea this is for you. Um, typical grants will be between 30 and 50 thousand pounds. The maximum project size is 80 thousand pounds without prior approval and uh, actually I'm just wondering Ed, if I can switch my screens around, we might be able to solve this problem because if people can't see it, it's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? If you are in, um, I think you need to go to. I think it's because my second screen is in landscape mode, not portrait. So um, that could be it. But like that's that isn't something I can change that easily. But I okay. can. Um, hopefully switch which screen is doing what. I think if you are able to be in slideshow mode rather than presenting yeah. mode. That's... Okay, still no dice. Right. So if you, if you can try it in slideshow mode. Yeah, it, well, yeah, it was, but I need to uh, do that on my uh, main screen. Okay. Okay. Hopefully, is that better, Ed? You can see that full screen. Um, I can't see anything at the moment. I can Fantastic. see 
this is just uh, this is working so well. Um, hold on then. I can see your screen now, which is, but it's got the yeah. um, presenter notes on that. Okay. Oh, perfect. perfect. Right. Okay. So I'll go notes free. Um, so typical grants, like I said, are between 30 and 50,000 pounds, maximum project size of 80,000 pounds. And if your project is over 80,000 pounds, you need to get in touch with us first. If it's, Within the realms of possibility, we'll be able to grant prior approval, and therefore, when it gets submitted, we can deal with the uh, deal with the application and process it for assessment. But if it uh, if it's above eighty thousand pounds and you haven't had prior approval, it'll unfortunately be struck off immediately, and there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, projects must start between the first of October and the end by the thirtieth of June next year, and last between three and six months. Uh, it could be new ideas or a radical redesign of goods, services, or business models, or a combination which serve an existing need in a way that doesn't rely on a single-use plastic solution. Uh, as I mentioned before, the projects need to follow the established human-centered research and design principles, and so must be grounded in a good knowledge of uh, customer uh, of how customers uses and people along the train are using or could use the solution that you're intending to come up with. Uh, here when we're talking about design, it could include anything needed to pull a design specification together. So engineering input, material, material science input, service design that we talked about this morning. Um, and projects should deliver a well-informed and viable design concept for an innovative project. Um, so th and there also needs to be actionable next steps for development towards commercialization. We're trying to stimulate innovation in design to reduce persistent plastic waste. And we're looking for a portfolio of projects across a, a range of different sectors. So I, I mentioned earlier, we weren't just talking, we're not just talking about packaging. We're looking across all sectors, including packaging. Um, if you have great ideas for packaging, I'm also interested in those for the other challenge that I'm working on. Um, projects could follow the following design disciplines, so industrial design, product design, user experience design, service design. It could be for a business-to-business -business or business-consumer application, and we would like to prioritize reuse or product life extension or a recycling, but ultimately recycling is still important. If it does focus on design for recycling, then you need to consider the existing recycling infrastructure and technology don't design something that is technically recyclable but not in the current infrastructure. Um, we also need to know where revenue generation and growth will, will occur in the UK as a result of exploiting the innovation. Projects were not funding for this competition, so no novel products or components that are single use. Uh, we also don't want anything really for this competition that's involved in energy generation from plastic waste or guidelines on how to design for recycling. Uh, that's not to say that Innovate UK might not be interested in some of, some of those kinds of concepts um, elsewhere and Innovate UK does have smart grants where the scope is much broader so feel free to look there if you don't fit with this competition. I'm now going to hand over to Izzy that can take you through the application process. Hi there, I'm just quickly going to share my screen. I hope you have a better look than I did, Izzy. <laughs> can everyone see that? Yes. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to take you through on um, how to apply on IFS and some of the other competition rules. So this competition allows for resubmission, so if you've um, put in an application to us before and it's been judged and you want to use the same one again, you are welcome to. Um, quick recap on your project eligibility, so to lead or standalone must be a UK registered business. 
uh, project must start by the 1st of October, end by the 30th of June 2021. Your project cost can be between 20 and 80,000 pound and the project length between three and six months. So the type of organisations that we fund include business, small, um, medium and large. This is all done by the EU definition. So if you're not entirely sure which area does your company sits in, do please check it out on their um, website. We also fund research organisations, public sector organisations and charities doing research activity. Uh, something to bear in mind that if you are 100% owned by a large parent company, uh, this means by EU rules you are classed as a large company and will only be entitled to that grant. To be eligible for state aid funding, um, your company, limited, limited liability company, sorry, uh, cannot <laughs> start that one again, shall we? We are unable to grant funding to limited liability companies meeting the condition known as undertakings in difficulty. Um, this is underneath the general block exemption regulation in which the state aid is found. Um, so if you are an undertaking in difficulty, it is where the, more than half the company's subscribed share capital has disappeared as a result of accumulated losses. Uh, this test only applies to companies that are more than three years old. And if you do have a parent company, it can be performed on that one. Um, so yes, when you're submitting your application, you must certify that you are eligible for state aid. If you're not sure, please do take legal advice. As I said, this one is under state aid article 25, which is um, funding for R&D projects that can be split into three categories, whether it's feasibility studies, industrial research or experimental development. The participation rules on this competition is that 70% of the total eligible project costs must be incurred by business and the maximum level for research organisations is at 30% of the project costs. If you intend to make more than one application, uh, if you are a business, you can be involved in three applications, but can only be the lead partner in one. If you uh, are an RTO or university, you can only be a lead partner in one application. Um, the rules of this also will be on IFS should you need to come back to it in any way. Um, if you are an RTO and you're not a lead, then you can partner in any number of applications. Something to bear in mind, if you have any current um, live projects with Innovate UK that are completely, well, are completed, um, but you have an outstanding final claim or an independent accountant report, we will not be able to fund you any further funding until these claims or the IARs have been submitted to Innovate. Um, also, if we feel that having funded your company before and we felt that you didn't make a substantial effort to exploit that award, again, we will award you no further funding. So something to bear in mind, uh, key dates, competition opens, as uh, Gavin said, on the 1st of June, closes on the 16th of September, briefing event is there today, and the deadline is the 16th, and you will be informed by the 30th of October. So IFS itself, um, if you've used IFS before, you can use your same login as you had previously. And if it's new to you, just search for the um, competition you'd like to apply to and create an account. Uh, we do suggest that UK businesses um, use Company House Lookup as it speeds up our checks. Um, and if you're a research organisation, we ask that you enter your information manually to make sure that you are not listed as business and therefore can, can receive the correct level of funding. We then ask you about your project. Uh, this will include the application team, so your collaborators or your contributors, the application details, including the title, timescales, what research category you want to fall under, innovation area, or whether or not it's a resubmission. Uh, project summary, so summarize your project and the objectives that you're looking uh, to achieve and what's innovative about it. And then a public description, so do make sure that whatever you put in this, you're happy to see published should you be successful. And the scope, how can you please tell us how it is that the project is in scope with this competition? The questions, um, there are only six com questions on this uh, competition. So question one is project motivation and objectives, project activities and outputs, team resources, risks, additionality, costs and value for money. You'll notice that questions two, three and four, not another three, is um, have appendices for you to fill in as well. There will be further information on IFS once this competition is live. So as you go down through the questions, it will give you all the relevant and detailed guidance that you need. Uh, right, when it comes to your finances. So first of all, um, to be able to claim funding, you must be registered on Companies House by the time you would like to receive your funding. And if your company's house number starts with an FC, BR and JE, unfortunately we cannot, um, we cannot uh, give you funding. So, 
down into the finances. We ask for your labour costs, so elder costs here are the staff working directly on the project. They must be paid by PAYE and it can include the NI pension non-discretionary costs. Ineligible costs include the dividends, bonuses and non-productive time. Overheads, um, so our definition for overheads is additional costs and operational expenses incurred directly as a result of the project and these can include additional costs for administrative staff, general IT, rent and utilities. So ones you can include, so indirect overheads, um, please ensure they are additional and directly attributable to the delivery of the project. And the direct overheads, so the office utilities, IT infrastructure, um, again, it must be directly attributable to the project and provide, we ask that you do provide a detailed breakdown together with the mythology and the basis apportionment. We will also be asking for your material um, costs. So materials, we say that you, can claim cost of materials as long as they are used on your project and they are not already purchased or included in the overheads. They are purchased from third parties and they won't have residual or resale value at the end of your project. Um, please be clear on what the materials are. So just putting consumables doesn't provide enough detail and should you be successful, we will be asking for more information. Your capital equipment usage, so the eligible ones here are uh, used in the project or shared with the day-to-day -day production. Calculations will need to be in line with your own accounting practices. And even if the equipment is depreciated fully over the life of the project, this must be added under capital equipment. Subcontractors are completely um, allowable in this competition as long as they're justified and quantified, especially if you're using a non-UK subcontractor. This one must be um, justified as to why you cannot use a UK-based subcontractor. And if you're subcontracting to a parent or sister company, please do just ensure that you list it at cost and not including any profit. Uh, travel and subsistence, um, eligible costs must be directly linked to the project. We ask that you break them down into the travel, accommodation and subsistence. Ah, subsistence. If you have an annual trip to visit your parent company, for example, this will not be an eligible cost. So other costs are ones that cannot be added under any other previous headings. We ask that you do not double count and have something to bear in mind when it comes to any patent filling, filing costs uh, for new IP, SMEs are entitled to up to seven and a half thousand pounds. So the funding rules, uh, level of funding awarded will depend upon the type of the organization and the type of research being undertaken in the project. Funding is calculated by the project participant. Um, IFS will advise you the maximum grant percentage that you can request based upon your answers to the type and size of your organization and again the research category. So uh, for example <coughs> if you're doing uh, industrial research business wise it can be broken down in 70, 60 or 50 percent and universities 80 percent um, of the FE, FEC. Um, again IFS will let us know if there's anything even slightly different it should fall under these. Um, Yes. So this is just an example of a consortium. Um, so just bear in mind that your research base in this competition cannot go over 30%. Um, you do not have to have this consortium, it is just to show the difference in the way that it can all be uh, worked out. And your academic partners will be using the JES forms. Um, they should be more than <coughs> accustomed to JES forms by now. And if they're not, do please talk to JES. Um, but we do use these to make sure that we're in line with the research councils um, of, the, of the UKRI. Everyone, we use these in the UKRI now. And um, yeah, we use them to collect the academic finances. Uh, the JES system will all <coughs> automate sorry, the collection of the FEC based costs from the academic partners. And from there, they know exactly which numbers, um, which costs to put into IFS, which we were asked to do on a separate page. Um, so they're asked to enter in their TSB reference number and the contribution column figures from your individual JES output document. And then we also ask you to upload that JES form uh, to IFS and we ask you, please do make sure that it does state with council is the status. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the JES application elements, so it's not just the financials, but the justification resources and pathways to impact. Um, again, if you have any queries about the JES form, do please uh, talk to JES uh, with this phone number or with this uh, email address. They'll be far more informative than I could possibly be regarding JES forms. But so, when submitting your application, um, your project cost summary, this will be, you'll be able to see this 
everyone in your consortium will be able to see the project cost summary. They will not, however, be able to go any further into your finances of individual companies. Um, but unless this is all filled in by all the partners, IFS will not allow you to submit. So do please ensure that like the highlighted costs are fits the criteria for the competition. So we're at the moment it's circled around the 581,000. This needs between 20 and 80. And all organizations, as I said, can see the summary. And then, um, as I mentioned, IFS will not allow you to submit until it's all completed. And the lead will be able to see who's not completed this at the time. Um, so all organizations have to be marked as the finances are complete. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, the research organization participant, I feeling will slightly different to what the slide is currently stating, unfortunately, but we will uh, double check that when it comes live on IFS. And then we do suggest that you submit your application early. This is a table that shows how high traffic gets to the midday um, submission time. Uh, as you can see, the high traffic, it's chances are if you're going to have any sort of issues on IFS, it's going to be during the high traffic area. So if you find that you do have problems submitting, do please get in contact with us as soon as possible. And we do everything we can to help you through. Once you have submitted, your application will be sent for assessment. Uh, oral applications are assessed by independent assessors from both industry and academia and they are looking for clear and concise answers, the right amount of information, quantification, justification and a proposal that presents a viable opportunity for growth, a level of innovation that necessitates public sector investment and has the right team and approach to be successful. So when it comes to your feedback, um, all the comments from assessors will be released to you and the feedback that's released is compiled using the written comments of the independent assessors and um, is intended to be constructive in nature and to highlight both the strong and the weak areas of your application. Um, your application will be assessed by more than one assessor, so you may receive information that could appear conflicting. Um, and it must also be noticed that some proposals may appear to have been favourably assessed based on their comments. Um, it could just be in these instances that your proposal simply fell below the funding threshold with others having achieved a higher score. Um, when it comes to what the assessors score and feedback on your applications, we do review the scores to make sure that they are adhering to our guidelines and scoring fairly. In some cases where we feel a score is unjust or not supported by the feedback, we could remove it as an outlier. Of course, this could be on both ends of the spectrum, a high or low outlier, so it could, um, could mean that your result goes up or down. Once the assessor feedback is um, released, the lead will be notified um, and then you'll be able to go onto IFS dashboard to look through your feedback. Should you be successful, there are eight steps to complete further before you can um, get your grant offer letter and therefore start your project. Um, these steps are applicable to all grant claiming partners. It has to be completed in 30 days and um, we do say that projects must start within 90 days or the funding could be withdrawn. However, at the moment we are aware and there are some leeways given the um, current global um, pandemic. We will also ask you to confirm your bank account. This is required, especially um, if you are a new company to us and therefore you could be asked to provide a redacted bank statement. Um, should you feel you will have something you'd like to change about your project, unfortunately you cannot do that until your project has started. Um, so we do say that to avoid any delays in the project setup area, think about in advance who you would like to be your project manager, who will be the finance contact for each consortium member, and how will your consortium be set up. So collaboration agreements, um, they're the one thing we do see that takes up an awful lot of time sometimes. Um, so we suggest that you do look into this sooner rather than later. Um, it's an agreement that needs to be signed by all participants. There is no template on IFS. Um, if you want something, there is a Lambert toolkit, but we do not offer up a template. It can be um, written however it is you see you'd like it to be, as long as it's signed by all consortium members. But some key features can include who's in the consortium, what are their aims and how the work is divided up, ownership of any IPR and the management of the consortium. When it comes to your grant claims and payments, all grants are claimable quarterly in arrears. The claims can only be made for costs incurred and paid between the project start and end dates. Claims must may be subject to an independent audit, depending on your grant size, and um, claims are only paid once quarterly reporting and audits are complete. Projects over six months are monitored on a quarterly basis, including visits from your monitoring officer, um, and the monitoring is carried out against detailed project plan and a financial forecast. And that's from my slides.
if there are any questions on that or should I stop sharing my screen? That's great. Thanks very much, Izzy. There's a lot of information there. Um, maybe if we stop, actually keep those details up at the moment because people probably want to just note those down. Um, so we've got lots of uh, questions generated from that, which I'm sure you'll um, want to hear. Uh, some simple ones to start off with. Um, firstly, um, will the will your slides be available um, from today? Are you happy um, to circulate the slides? Yes, if this has also been recorded, um, we can keep a link to that on IFS on the date tab. Okay, that's great. Also, this webinar is being recorded, so we will send the recorded link to everybody following uh, closure of the event today. Um, so everybody can review all that because there's a lot of information contained in those slides and so you need to go back to those and refer to them at various points in the application um, between now and September. Um, so a couple of uh, questions that have cropped up. Can you, um, Gavin or Izzy, can you just clarify the nature of this, the, the nature of companies, the, the size of companies? Um, are you looking for particular sectors? Um, just in that sort of eligibility of type of company? Sure. Um, I think in terms of the size of the business applying or the or, or organization applying, um, any size essentially and from any sector, if they have an idea um, that is relevant and they can either, and they either want to pursue that using internal resource or through working with some subcontracted design res uh, resource they're eligible if the idea is eligible okay so so pretty broad scope there yeah but they have to, the lead organization needs to be uk based okay uh another question so can a can an rto lead that is a good question um nick can you remember where we landed on that one uh yes i can and no they can't they can certainly can collaborate um, or could act as a subcontractor. Um, you know, want to make that clear uh, for this competition, we recognize that um, there might be extensive use of design specialists as subcontractors. That's fine. But remember, if you are a subcontractor, um, you don't complete the application. It's a private relationship between the project and yourself. Um, but we do ask that applicants indicate and give details and justifications for any and all subcontractors that they would propose to use within the project. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we did mention, you went through the, the milestones and the particular dates. Um, could you just uh, recap on those, please, the sort of the milestones for the competition? Yep, it opens on the 1st of June, closes at midday on the 16th of September, and the applicants will be notified on the um, by 30th of October, and then the feedback will be released shortly after that. Okay. Fantastic. Yep, and just to add to that, the, the project start date must be by the 1st of, sorry, what did you say there, Izzy, on the, um, on the, on the October day? Uh, the 30th of October, wasn't it? Okay, so that's it, where the error lies then in my uh, slide, where my slide said the project start date should be the 1st of October. Which obviously wouldn't be possible if they weren't notified until the end of October. Okay. So we're saying that the project start date is after the end of October, basically. Okay. Um, and is there any anticipation expectation in terms of spend profile through the financial year? Is there a aim date by which the project needs to be finished? Um, so far we said the project needs to finish by the end of June next year. Okay, so that's giving about eight months? Yeah, and they should be between three to six months in terms of project length. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so just a couple of points on clarifying um, the nature of funding received being for costs incurred. So presumably that's the nature of the costs which are 
um, borne by the project and perhaps the timing of reimbursement? How, how does that work? Can you just clarify that for the competition, please? Well, I'm sure Nick will chime in on this one, but I believe it's uh, quarterly in arrears that the grants are paid. Yeah, they are. The, um, we do ask that all applicants are able to support the first three months of their project um, unaided. Um, it is match funding. It's not. Um, we have to make sure that anything that you spend is within a certain within the start date and the end date, um, which you'll be signing on your GOL, which is your grant offer letter once you get to that stage. OK, fantastic. Any other questions that people have for Nick or Gavin or Izzy at this point? Okay, so flushing out a few more here. Uh, so a uh, question around the guidance. So please, please could you clarify the guidance regarding 70% of the costs having to be incurred by businesses and 30% for other? Um, well, there's a limit of the 30% for the research organisations on the total eligible project costs. So the rest of the costs will be incurred by business. Is that, did I, sorry, if I misunderstood that, do you let me know. Okay, please, please come back to us if that's not um, clarified. Uh, I, I'd chip in to say there's no requirement to have an academic partner or, a, or an RTO partner in a project. But if you do, their uh, proportion of the grant is capped at 30%. So if you are, for example, a company working purely by yourself, then obviously 100% of the costs are incurred by you and you can claim back the appropriate um, percentage. Okay. Um, another question on just sort of what scope and what's, what's desired here. Um, so slight, if you could clarify on one point, single use, is not allowed but recycling is a key need question mark yes so if i mean we're talking about designing things made from plastic ultimately so if uh, we're not looking for something that uh, is a single use product to come out of this but if it's going to be made from plastic our view is it should be designed to be recycled at some point anyway Okay, thank you, Gavin. Hopefully that clarifies it. Uh, do you um, have to ha actually have a consortium or could you uh, apply as a single applicant on this? You can be a single applicant um, or a consortium. It's completely depending on it completely dependent on the capabilities you have in house or whether you want to collaborate outside of your organization. Uh, you might need to or you might want to, but ultimately you don't have to if you're able to do everything in house and want to do it that way. Okay, and presumably there's there's no advantage or preference trying to make a consortia if you don't need one and no advantage to pursuing your own if you uh, don't need to have additional partners on board. There's no sure. way to do that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Sally has in usefully added a, a connection to a sort of a, a template agreement uh, between um, universities and businesses. If you want to um, access that, that's in the chat. So thank you very much, Sally, for that. Uh, so in terms of eligibility of companies, this includes uh, startups, does it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and any rec so, so a question, any recommendations for uh, initial startup businesses applying to this fund? Um, recommendations in what in what way uh, so perhaps if nicholas who posed the question can come back with some specifics for us that'd be great i mean i'd say my recommendation is if you've got a great idea go for it <laughs> the quality and robustness of idea yes um 
So I think you can, this will be fairly easy to cover. So can I cover, can I apply for this funding if the product um, has already been fully developed and is now moving into manufacturing or is it exclusively for new ideas? Well, I think it depends if there is a design element of, uh, that still needs to be completed about how the product is going to go to market. Maybe it's around uh, the design of the business model. Um, then there is, uh, you know, obviously there are design elements still to be considered that could be turned into the project. It doesn't need to be about the way in which the particular product is designed. If you have a product, but you, you need to design how that's going to go out into the world. I mean, I would say that those things should have been considered, that should be considered from the start anyway, but maybe those are the things that you need help funding. Mm -hmm. um, so does that answer the question? Okay. Um, so interesting question here. Do you have examples of previous awards? Innovate UK. Um, so I think there's a number of ways we could, we could frame this. I mean, there's, there's extensive um, case studies in terms of uh, how awards being made to companies in terms of design support. And there's extensive information on how Innovate UK has funded companies within this space for, um, for plastics and also for circular economy and for business models um, innovation. So um, th there's plenty of evidence out there. Yeah, yeah. Ed, you know, there's our, if you go take a look at the Innovate UK, UKRI YouTube channel, you'll find case studies of specific projects. Um, if you are uh, really keen, uh, just Google Innovate UK competition results. Um, we, we post them by year. There's well over 8,000 uh, projects that we've funded so far. It's been a while since I've checked the total number. Uh, and online, uh, you can always find a funded project, uh, the public summary and the funding details and breakdowns by partner, which might, might be interesting to some people to take a look. And I think particularly, I, I, I don't know if Ben's still on the call, but this competition owes a great deal to the design strategy that Innovate UK and, and the KTN people worked on, people like Ben and Ed. And there are a few, uh, there were a few competitions run that were specifically called design foundations. I mean, there's multiple rounds, I think, isn't there, Ed? And, you know, though those were, weren't specific to this plastics issue, that might help you get a flavor for the sorts of projects that were undertaken using the model that this competition is based on. And for the more historically minded, and this does take a little bit of YouTube foo to find your way to it, uh, a long time ago, we, we ran a competition called New, New, New Designs for a Circular Economy. And there are a good five or six little um, video case studies from some of those projects including one that leaps to mind, which was with a um, somewhat controversial figure at the moment, but uh, Dyson, uh, and that was around uh, utilizing biopolymers in the manufacture of consumer electronic goods, Hoovers. Fantastic. I'll just um, also, if, if you're interested, go to the KTN website and type in design, yep. and that will, that will bring up a whole portfolio of case studies for you there. Um, Final few minutes, just the last few questions to, to rattle through. Um, does the fund cover the development or enhancement of a prototype? Um, so I think we've we've covered that already. Yeah, um, I'd say yes. Uh, if you if your idea is at early stage and you need uh, help to take it forward, yes. Yeah, uh, and can it be a modeling process that allows products to be designed from recycled material with perhaps a commercial example? So, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, without a, a great deal more detail, um, I wouldn't roll, rule that out of scope, but I probably, I would be anticipating, you know, the kind of where the human centered aspects of that project were based on a quick sentence, which is by no means anywhere near enough detail. It's worth, uh, it's worth pointing out um, that 
if you would like a formal decision as to whether or not your project idea is in scope, then uh, please do send a, a really short outline, uh, you know, a paragraph or two, describing the project to our support at innovateuk.gov.org email address. Sorry, innovateuk.ukri.org. I don't remember our own email address. <laughs> How embarrassing. Um, and formally request confirmation of being in scope. The reason it's important to send that to our support at uh, customer support team is that question and the response will be formally logged, which is effectively our way of saying you could rely on that later in court. Um, if you just chat to uh, even me, uh, Gavin or Izzy or anyone from the KTN and we kind of say, yeah, that sounds like it'd be in scope. Uh, that you wouldn't be able to rely on later in court if in the fullness of time we decided that um, the project wasn't in scope. So do feel free to test scope by emailing us. Um, and we'll always aim to get back to you within three business days with a, with a, with a formal response. Okay, thanks very much, Nick. Um, in the light of time, keeping everybody to schedule because everybody is busy at the moment, um, <clears throat> I'm just going to conclude the questions there. Um, thank you very much for, for posing those. I hope we've covered most of the uh, burning issues that you wanted answered. Um, just as a, as a wrapper, I'd like to thank all the contributors and panellists to the event today. I thought it was really, really interesting. Um, all the perspectives from, from business, from uh, across Innovate UK, um, on just the, the, the opportunities that were presenting themselves and then leading into this competition. So thank you very much for contributing and it's made, I hope, a very valuable experience for everyone today. The recording, uh, this is recorded, uh, so it will be available for everybody um, from today onwards and we will send around the link. Just to highlight that in terms of taking the applications forward and whether you're interested in bidding for that uh, competition, then uh, my colleagues have been offering their support and help in the Zoom chat box. Um, and so I'd just like to bring attention to the, the sort of channels that you might wish to pursue. So um, you heard from my colleague, Sally Beckin, who is our KTM for Polymers. Um, you, will have, you may have seen my colleague, Veronica Sanchez Romaguera, who is our Materials and Circular Economy KTN. Um, she's offered uh, help in supporting or looking through applications uh, and in advance of the competition. Uh, ben Peace is our head of manufacturing. So if there are aspects in terms of uh, manufacturing dimensions to this, uh, to this either consortia building or, or to this application, then Ben is a good contact point. And also from a, from a design perspective, the design team are here to help um, in terms of you know, collaborations and finding um, design partners, uh, putting those capabilities and skills together. Um, Anna Marie has uh, posted a LinkedIn group, which we have used for previous competitions where designers particularly can, um, uh, are invited to put their profiles and their LinkedIn profiles into that group. So it's a good place to, for companies to, to look uh, for designers who are, who are aware of the call, who are interested, who perhaps have some experience in applying for these kind of funds um, already and so maybe good partners for you in terms of finding a good design partner for your for your bid. Um, Anita is there anything else that we would uh, like to mention at this point before we before we wrap up? Um, I think actually Ed you've done a fantastic job you've covered all all of the bases really and um, just a final thing to say to people um, thank you so much for those who booked meetings and had meetings during the lunch hour hopefully they were they went okay um, and, and those who have booked meetings straight after the event please do um, check your emails to confirm the meetings and then have those as well and the page is also available tomorrow and Friday as well so anybody who didn't have the chance to um, book meetings or have any today you still have a chance to set up a profile as well as book your meetings and have one-to-ones you can also send messages to each other in the meeting mojo system so if none of those days actually work um, for work reasons or any other reasons you can actually message the person who has requested a meeting for you with you and just suggest a different time a different date 
Um, but otherwise, I hope you enjoyed everything and um, hope that the networking is useful. It's our, it's our first time doing this um, virtual online, so um, I'll be sending out a feedback form to everybody. And um, please do send in any recommendations if you have ideas of how we can make your networking whilst we're in a virtual world um, as smooth and as helpful as possible. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much everybody and uh, have a nice afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Bye everybody. Thanks everyone, bye.